Hello, I'm Jay Ingram. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's lineup of fascinating speakers. It was a great day. And of course, the discussion that followed. You can expect a lot more of that today as we tackle topics like frailty as a risk factor for Alzheimer's, the role of resilience in understanding the progress or progression of Alzheimer's disease, and the importance of diversity and inclusion in clinical studies of Alzheimer's. And then we'll finish the day tying together all of the reasons as to why we haven't solved Alzheimer's yet and what needs to change to make that happen. This is a topic that has long interested the Gardner Foundation, an organization established to recognize and reward Canadian scientists who are working on life-changing research. Now I'd like to call upon Dr. Janet Rossent, a world-renowned developmental biologist and the president and scientific director of the Gardner Foundation to say a few introductory words. Janet. Thank you, Jay. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am the president and scientific director of the Gardner Foundation, which is a, a wonderful job to have. The Gardner Foundation, uh, if you don't know much about it, is uh, really an organization that celebrates excellence in science. And so we're very pleased to be able to partner with the Kremble Brain Institute, University Health Network, and Johns Hopkins University on this important symposium. And we're very grateful to the Kremble Foundation for their support of today's events. We're looking forward to another great day of insights into progress on addressing the challenges, the ongoing challenges of Alzheimer's. But I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Gardner Foundation. For those of you, I see we're watching from around the world who are not familiar with the Gardner Foundation. So I'll share a few details. The foundation was founded in 1957 by a Toronto philanthropist, James Gardner. And it's been supported by the government of Canada with, some, with an endowment since 2008. The foundation awards annual prizes to scientists from around the world whose discoveries have had a major impact on scientific progress and human health. Since 1959, more than 395 scientists from 35 countries have received a Canada Gardner Award, and to date, 95 have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize. In addition to celebrating scientific excellence, we convene leaders from around the world to address major health issues through events like today's. We also aim to inspire the next generation of scientists and innovators, and we run outreach programs across Canada where our laureates share their research and their career paths with students. Please visit gardner.org to learn more about our events, including, importantly, the upcoming announcement of the 2021 Canada Gardner Awardees taking place by video on April the 7th. I hope you enjoy the day's symposium, and now I invite you to watch this video about risk factors for Alzheimer's. Mom has Alzheimer's. I wonder if I will get it too. Is my family gonna be okay? Can I prevent this from happening to me? Hi, I'm Jay Ingram science broadcaster and author of the book, The End of Memory, A Natural History of Aging and Alzheimer's. Worldwide, 50 million people are affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And that number is expected to triple over the next 30 years. Alzheimer's disease is undoubtedly the greatest long-term global threat to health that we face today. We know that age, gender, and genetics all play a role in Alzheimer's disease, but there are ways you can reduce your risk. It starts early with education. Many in-depth studies have established that your level of education can directly affect the risk of getting Alzheimer's later in life. Formal education helps you build what's called cognitive reserve. It keeps your brain resilient and protects against the kind of damage that can lead to Alzheimer's disease. Learning a second language, picking up a hobby, both can help keep your brain fit and healthy, but the sooner, the better. If you're between 45 and 65, hearing loss 
is a significant risk for Alzheimer's. So be sure to get hearing tests and hearing aids can help too. Obesity is also a significant risk, as is consuming more than two alcoholic drinks every day. And managing your blood pressure, whether by healthy eating or exercise, or if necessary, medication can also reduce your risk. Now, this is new. We now know that traumatic brain injury, such as concussion, can trigger processes in the brain that may lead to Alzheimer's and dementia. So wear a helmet if you're engaging in sports and proper footwear, especially in the winter, to reduce the chances of injury due to an accident or a fall. After the age of 65, you're gonna to wanna to stay as physically active as possible with as much cardio as you can handle. That way you'll keep your body and your brain in good shape. Diabetes is another risk. People with type two diabetes are twice as likely to develop dementia and cigarette smokers run a 45% increased risk. Quitting smoking at any age can ward off a number of diseases, including Alzheimer's. Social isolation and depression are both prevalent and devastating for the elderly. And both have been linked to an increased risk for Alzheimer's. And finally, it makes a difference where you live and work. New studies have shown that air pollution can be linked to an increased risk for neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer's. And that risk is highest for women over 65. By taking action to avoid these modifiable risk factors, experts believe that 40% of all cases of dementia could either be delayed or prevented altogether. 40%. I think of my mother in the last few years of her dementia, and how hard life was on her and my father. This disease has taken far too many lives far too early. But remember, it's never too late to reduce your chances of developing Alzheimer's or dementia. Know the risks, change the outcome. Our goal at Kremble is to advance knowledge about Alzheimer's disease and the related dementias. We are dedicated to basic science research, translational research, and clinical research focused on Alzheimer's disease to reduce the risks, to better diagnose it, and to come up with cures for the disease. Know the risks, change the outcome. That may seem like a long list of risks, but we're in a position in 2021 where at least we've identified them. And when you put them together cumulatively, as you, say, as you saw, you can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia by as much as 40%. So remember that line, know the risks, change the outcome. And you have the power to re to do that, to reduce those risks by to by paying attention to them and changing your lifestyle where you can. About today, a quick reminder to everyone about the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. If you do have a question for one of our speakers, please make note of which speaker the question is addressed to. And you can also upvote other questions that resonate with you. We'll answer a question or two at the end of each talk, but save the rest for the panel discussion later today. We likely won't be able to get to all the questions, but we'll try and include as many as possible. There's also a chat feature on Crowdcast, the software we're using on the right-hand side of your screen. This sort of interactivity is great. That's what we're hoping for. We just ask that you please be considerate to your fellow symposium goers in the comments. And finally, if you're posting on social media, please include our hashtag, hashtag solve Alzheimer's and tag us at at KBI underscore UHN. Now, our first speaker today is Dr. Kenneth Rockwood, professor of geriatric medicine and neurology at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. He's also a staff physician at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center, a leading authority on frailty. Dr. Rockwood has more than 500 peer-reviewed publications and nine books to his credit. He's also associate director of the Canadian Collaboration on Neurodegeneration in Aging. Welcome, Dr. Rockwood. 
So I apologize to the audience for this disruption. I can assure you that everything worked in rehearsal. Uh, so I want to consider the proposition that one of the reasons we're not having success we might have with dementia is we failed to really appreciate the role that aging plays in Alzheimer's disease and in many other diseases of old age. So if I had the slides here, I'd be showing you something now which suggests that the rate at which we accumulate things wrong with us, in other words, the rate at which we age, um, is fairly constant for the group over the lifespan. And it's around 4.5% deficit accumulation per year. And if you know the rule of 72, you'll know that means that we double our aging rate, we double our aging numbering wrong with us at a constant rate every 15 years. And it turns out that for most people, the last doubling time they'll have is between the ages of 75 and 90. And that is not by coincidence the age at which most people who are diagnosed with dementia in Canada will be diagnosed. And it's not just dementia. Other common diseases like heart failure and chronic disease requiring um, it at an end stage, all these things coincide at this point. And so when people have talked about population aging and the impact that it's likely to have on healthcare, this is what they mean. So aging is the accumulation, chiefly at cellular and molecular levels, of damage that turns into a deficit if it doesn't go removed or repaired. And these things accumulate with time and they accumulate imperceptibly but like any exponential process, it's the last doubling time, which is so extremely important. And again, for most people, because deficit accumulation is related to death, the last one we'll get is between 75 and 90. This one is just showing many things happen with aging at molecular and cellular levels. I'll draw your attention to the purple one uh, at about five o'clock, which says loss of proteostasis. And that means uh, protein misfolding, which is one of the key features of the current theories of how Alzheimer's disease is important. And I point out this is an age-related process, but it's not the only thing. And the approach we've taken for the most part in Alzheimer's disease has been to say, look, it's this age-related process which is important, and that's it. But that's not so. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. A and an important thing to know about this, the way acceleration works, is that the environments in which we live or the genetics that we bring to bear have a double whammy. The things that make damage more likely makes repair more difficult. In computer science, it's a term of art called the Matthew effect. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, to them who have much, more shall be given, and to those without, even that that they have shall be taken away. And that's the effect that we see commonly with dementia and its acceleration. Next slide, please. So, so we know for sure that people age at different rates. We see this in countries over time, but within a country, we see it chiefly based on socioeconomic strata. And so the people who are the fittest say at age 70, who are in the most vulnerable third of our population, age at twice the rate that people who are the highest level of socioeconomic status. So variable aging is an actual thing that we see all the time and is driven by a number of factors, but particularly socioeconomic status. And that whole concept of variability in the rate of aging is one way to think about frailty. Frailty is variability in the risk of death for people the same age. And the approach that we've taken is to say that that occurs when people have more things wrong with them than others do at the same age. And we proceeded from there with a certain success. Next slide, please. So there are so many things to think about that we need practical means of trying to understand everything that's happening with aging. 
there's a, a really important group in the Netherlands which has done a lot of work about this. They think about resilience or robustness and such. We, we, we've, we've taken a slightly different approach with that. We're, we're aligned with them, but we take a slightly different approach. Next slide, please. So the approach that we've taken is used in any parts of the world, but it's used with some um, enthusiasm in the UK. So I'm showing you the outline of a graph here. On the x-axis is age from 65 to 95 and a bit more. On the y-axis, on the on, on the side, uh, is the survival by days from 1800 days. And these are data on 365,000 people in whom this is routine, routinely calculated. The degree of frailty is routinely calculated. Next button hit, please. So you can see that it's going to be portrayed as a heat map. Green means they don't have much wrong with them, and red means they got a lot wrong with them. And next button, please. And so you can see that across age, a few things happen with respect to the lethality of frailty. So when people are young, you know, 65, just you know, really puppies, um, we can see that there is a differential in survival by the degree of frailty. But it's much tighter than what we see at the age of 95, where, again, the lethality of frailty increases, but the spread is wider, the variability is wider, and even the fittest 95-year-old can't expect to live as long as even the frailest 65-year-old. So age winds up clearly being important, even when we understand the degree of frailty that people have. This is a favorite topic of mine, and there's a million things to say, but we're just going to move on under the stress of the presser and the time. Okay, so, so accelerated aging or frailty has many causes, and there are things that we can do that would be helpful, that help to slow that rate, and there are things that we can do that are harmful or get exposed to that will accelerate that rate. But I just draw your attention on the left-hand side that social engagement, exercise, many things that Jay spoke about um, in his video really are important for the rate of aging, not just the risk of dementia. Let's go to the next slide, please. And many things that scientists have looked at at cellular molecular levels to understand how age manifests in varying uh, or organ systems, here the heart, can be better understood uh, if we grade it not by age, but by the degree of frailty. So on the, on the vertical axis here is better function. So higher is better. And this is work done with a preclinical model, mice actually. Uh, and they looked at various measures of how calcium gets released in, into the heart cells, how the heart cells contract, how chronic changes in this change the shape and size of the heart cell and so on. And this is representative data brought together from all that work done by the Howlett Lab at Dalhousie University. And you can see how that there's overlap in terms of the adult, the merely adult, mice and the aged ones. But you can see how much of this is resolved when we take into account the degree of frailty that these animals have, excluding the measures that have to do with their heart. So it's a phenomenon of other things that happen with aging, which give rise to this. Next slide, please. So we've done a bunch of work, which more or less resolves like this. If people are both healthy in their brains and healthy in their body, have an active lifestyle or fit, their dementia risk is very low, even as age increases. If it turns out, on the other hand, they have the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease, plaques and tangles, well, A, they won't just have that, they'll have other things as well. But if, if they have that, but they're exercising and otherwise fit, their risk of dementia is substantially lower than if they're frail. So this might not sound like much, but it's a revolutionary idea. When I was a boy in the 1980s, when I was just starting out this work, the, the dogma then was that the only definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was made at neuropathology, at autopsy, at death. That was the only way to get a definitive diagnosis. 
But then it became apparent over some years in community-based autopsy work that many people who met the criteria for Alzheimer's disease neuropathologically didn't have it clinically before they died. And you can imagine there was a, it took a while for people to accept that. They said, no, they weren't characterized well enough. The studies weren't good enough and so on. But now it's pretty much not disputed that that's the case. And so we've done some work to demonstrate at, at autopsy that the people who had the clinical diagnosis that we used to call Alzheimer's disease and imagine it was the same as dementia, didn't have the dementia if they were fitter. And they did if they were frailer whether or not they have um, the neuropathologic criteria or not are met. So in other words, some people had very mild manifestations uh, neuropathologically, but they still had it. So in, in my view, this tells us there are other things that are going on that are really important, that even if we could reduce the degree of amyloid in an individual, that wouldn't be enough in and of itself. Next slide, please. And so here's some work from uh, one of the big community-based autopsy studies, which makes this point, I was just saying, that, that the pathology does not dictate who has the clinical dementia. Next slide, please. And this is some of the work that uh, we have done to look at the degree of frailty that an, an individual has and their risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in relation to the degree of Alzheimer pathology. So I draw your attention to on the far side of the, of the horizontal axis, the X axis, you can see that if you've got a lot of Alzheimer pathology, you're not gonna get away with not having clinical dementia. But if you're at a very important stage of the illness, the chance of you actually getting the dementia in relation to the degree of neuropathology remains modifiable and it remains an important degree of benefit, even with a fair amount of Alzheimer pathology. Next slide, please. And that was work from uh, a database in the US that we worked with, the Rush database, uh, led by David Bennett at uh, Rush Chicago. Uh, and this is a similar portrayal of data, and this is from uh, Cambridge University, uh, Carol Brain's uh, database, the CC75C. So, so, so the idea is that this is not some fluke that turned up in a single database. We will demonstrate it in a series of databases. Next slide, please. Um, and in the same way, without access to neuropathology, but being able to look at the degree of frailty and a very high risk group of people who have a form of mild cognitive impairment and how that transitions into mild dementia, that too is driven by the degree of frailty, particularly in the people who have a particular form of um, mild cognitive impairment. So again, we don't have to wait till someone dies to figure out what's going on here. Next slide, please. And this is the case even with APOE4. That's a bit of detail. Let's just move on to the next slide in view of the time. So here's what I'm claiming. The greater the degree of frailty, the greater the risk of dementia. The risk comes from a greater degree of dementia in neuropathology. It, these are not unrelated. It's not wrong to study plaques and tangles and such. But I think that we shouldn't only look at that because there's an important notion of being able to resist how that neuropathology is expressed as dementia. And that interestingly appears to be independent of APOE4 genetic risk. And it's greatest in people with more than just memory problems. Next, please. So now what? How do we learn from this? So excitingly, the notion of somehow being able to treat processes of aging is not science fiction anymore. And this is a shot from a trial that's going on uh, called STOMP AD, in which they're trying a, a class of compounds called senolytic drugs, um, which we can go into if there's time. But in any event, that's going on right now. 
And because you can't get indication in the US, you can't get approval to treat aging, cleverly what they're doing is looking at common diseases of aging for which there's no cure. They started with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They looked at uh, chronic kidney disease and people with diabetes, and they're looking at Alzheimer's disease as well as a target of treatment for this approach. Next slide, please. So one of the things that is interest, we, we do know that it's possible to prevent Alzheimer's disease. We, we spent a lot of time with this in the Lancet Commission, trying to get our minds around that idea, but that wasn't the hard part because there's a lot of studies which show generally around the world, the age-related incidence of dementia is falling. Now the prevalence is still going up because so many uh, people are being old. But what we're seeing right now on the right-hand side is that even though the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia is going down, cognitive impairment in some studies is going up. And why is that? Because there's no reason to expect that successful treatment or even successful prevention of Alzheimer's disease will cure it, will put us back to a state of no cognitive impairment. And that's important because we, if we're going to do this work, we get the, the expectations right and the milestones right. Next slide, please. Um, this idea is not so far outside the mainstream. There's a lot of work which shows that cardiovascular risks, controlling cardiovascular risks are important for reducing the chance of dementia in late life. And so we celebrate that. But what our group is trying to draw to attention, there's more to it than just the cardiovascular risk. They're important because they're important. They're also important because they're common. But other common things we should be putting this, that are risk factors, we, we should be putting effort into preventing those as well. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that is really important is this idea of delirium the acute confusional state. So here's what I want to draw to attention. So there's a lot of work which shows that delirium accelerates cognitive decline. Delirium accelerates cognitive decline. Delirium is extremely important. It's lethal. It's underrecognized. It damages the people who survive it. And yet we've devoted almost no attention to delirium which itself may be preventable as a preventable risk factor for dementia. And the reason that's so important is because at a time in which Alzheimer trials are desperate to recruit people, we have hospitals full of people with delirium in whom we're not managing it well or treating it well. That's not just Canada, this is a worldwide phenomenon. So we've got to change our thinking about how we imagine late life dementia. And we got to get away from the one thing at a time approach to it. And we have to take a broad understanding of its intrinsic relationship with aging, coupled with the fact that people age at varying rates and find some cause for optimism in that because we know that it's possible to resist even the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a summary of a lot of what Jay uh, talked about. This is the Lancet Dementia Commission, and, and, and he drew to attention the important role of hearing loss in life and several other things. Frailty is just starting to sneak in there under the rubric of uh, physical inactivity, but there's there's so much more to it than, than that, and this becomes a way for us to uh, integrate a lot of information about other diseases that may individually increase the risk of dementia, but are best looked at in terms of the background of the other things that people have accumulated across the life course. Next slide, please. So how dementia might be prevented is more or less to close that gap between having neuropathology and, and expressing it. So we need to reduce neuropathology to the extent that we can. I'm, I'm not against that, but I'm against imagining that everything else is wrong, that nothing else deserves funding, that, that everything else is somehow fringe. We need to think about the best evidence we have right now about dementia in humans is from humans. 
And that's pointing us away from what we might expect if we only work on knocked in or knocked up or knocked out mouse models. Next slide, please. So we also need to take into account the tremendous information that's coming from the community-based autopsies studies. So for example, the work from uh, Rush, even just the work from 2017 uh, led by David Bennett, showing that very few old people have pure Alzheimer's. Most of the other things that are going on as, as, as well contribute to by our work from that database showing that frailty has an important impact on who expresses the dementia, not just who has the pathology. Next slide, please. So in summary, I propose that an important reason we've not cured Alzheimer's disease is because of our failure to treat it as disease of aging. We know that as a disease of aging, dementia and other diseases come with other things wrong with them as well. And these operate at several levels. We know that variability in these deficits and deficit accumulation or frailty influences risk. And it may be now appropriate to think about dementia as an aging syndrome influenced by the effect of frailty on disease expression. And then we should tackle that. Next slide, please. So we need to back more than one horse. We need to be aware of fashion. We need to be aware of how pharma has a, a, a very big influence in terms of what gets funded or talked about or how data get presented and such. We should look for advantages and fund them and not just do what everyone else is doing anyway. I think it's important in Canada where we seem determined to underfund dementia research. We should think hard about this paradox that we have hospitals full of people at risk, but we have clinical trials that are begging for patients. In short, we need, to, we need trials that better address the patients that we actually have, not the ones we'd like to have. Next slide, please. So no one does work like this on their own. I've been extremely fortunate to get great funding over my career. The CIHR, uh, something called the Fountain Family Innovation Fund at the Queen Elizabeth Second Health Sciences Center, which has provided me with an ongoing backup to uh, allow us to explore crazy ideas uh, over the course of 20 years. Uh, Alzheimer's Society of Canada, various other groups, and particularly the Housing Medical Research Foundation, uh, which funds my chair in Alzheimer research. I'm going to end there. Thank you for your patience. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, you did get cheated a little by technology at the beginning there. So I want to try and redress that a little bit. Um, at one point in your talk, you say you I think you were addressing frailty specifically. And you said, oh, this is one of my great interests. I would I could talk a lot more about this. Um, so we can give you a couple of minutes now if there are some aspects of frailty that you were not able to address then that you'd like to now. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. And I, I, I know that people are talking about resilience and robustness and so on. And I think those are really important ideas. One of the things that we're learning from a lot of the work by many groups is that we need a quantitative approach to this. And so I say that as important as the words are to translate what's going on, we need to take approaches where we have an intersection between mathematics and physics and bioinformatics and clinical medicine and neuropathology. And that's been historically a really difficult area to fund. You know, it's, it's, it's not mathy enough for the math funding crowd and it's way too mathy for the biology crowd. And, and we need a sweet spot for that. Uh, there, there used to be such a group and then it got uh, taken over as commercialization or some sort of thing. Th 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 there's pure science in this area where a little investment goes a long way because we're not off buying fancy isotopes and various things, just computers and smart young people. Uh, you mentioned uh, delirium. Could you explain exactly what that is? Yeah, thanks. So delirium is otherwise known as the acute confusional state. It's a manifestation of illness in frail older adults. So when frail older people get sick, they often get confused and they often fall down and they often take to bed and won't get out. And that may seem like a pretty straightforward issue, but when they do this, they violate 
the number one thing we ask of patients when they come to the hospital. Tell us what's going on. Every doctor will say to you, 90% of the time, we make a diagnosis on a history. And here's someone who can't give a history. And in all the years I've been doing this, I've almost never had a med student company and say, well, how come no one teaches us to deal with the patients that we see? Like you would talk about history, I can't get a history. And you talk about all these signs and you know, this person with pneumonia didn't have a fever. They've always got a cough. How am I gonna diagnose pneumonia there? And we really need to adapt what we do to take into account the diseases that we see. Dementia is just one, but all the diseases of, that go with frailty, all the frailty syndromes, falls and social abandonment and functional decline and delirium, the, we need as a country to do a much better job at this. This is a plea for geriatric medicine, by the way, if we're, so we're clear. Uh, the movie that was just released with Anthony Hopkins called The Father portrays this beautifully in the sense that he's not sure ever who he's really talking to or who he just talked to before. And his life is made uh, miserable as a result. I just want to move on to um, uh, one of the, in one of your slides, it suggested that where you live is a, a crucial factor. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, so the angle of it that I know the most about is the degree of social vulnerability that an individual experiences. And we take into account a number of things, none of them surprising. It's things like education and social position, how much income you have, what access to resources you have. Some of it can be mitigated by you know, a, a good friend networks and so on. But even with that, we find that growing up poor, growing up with greater stresses, growing up without access to the same degree of social support and physical support when it's needed, all these things, we, we pay a price in late life for, for that. And I think that's a really important issue for us in Canada because we don't have the same ideological divides about helping out people who are disadvantaged, right? But we got to get on with it and we got to have a more structured approach to this. We need to understand the very many manifestations of it, including what happens in late life. So um, if the picture is, uh, as you're suggest saying strongly, uh, more than just plaques and tangles in the brain, uh, and then we look around the globe and see that uh, there are varying levels of socioeconomic status and, and many other environmental conditions, does that suggest to you that the way to treat or prevent Alzheimer's in different countries will be significantly different? So I think that every country is going to need to arrive at a similar position where there is, for example, less social disadvantage, more childhood education, and so on. Presumably though the pathways of how they get there will be substantially different reflecting on their circumstances. Uh, the idea of the importance rather of exercise came up yesterday uh, uh, Laura Baker said, you know, it's not just enough to go for a slow, casual walk in the garden. You've got to huff and puff. Um, is that, does that square with what you know that uh, exercise, uh, there's good exercise and there's exercise that might not be quite as efficient in delaying or preventing Alzheimer's? So I think that's reasonable, but I'm very hesitant to get too far with that because it's really important to encourage people to move in the first instance. So one of the things I know in, in, in my practice, I've, I've prescribed exercise for 25 years. I figured out a few things just through having done so much badly during that time. And, and, and so I'm aware that we have to make it relevant for the individual. We have to ease them into it. We have to be patient. We have to be persistent and we have to pay attention to the things that will be important for them. So for example, many people won't take up exercise because they're self-conscious about how they look. So we need to figure out ways in which we can help them with that. So, you know, I tell people don't buy clothes or too tight fitting, you know, a little bit of looseness isn't a bad thing when you go into the gym. Don't figure you got to start at the gym, right? Walk around the block for a bit, set some goals and achieve them. And these things happen in fairly predictable ways but we need to support people in, in that. It's like stopping smoking, right? Not only stop smoking the first time, that'd be, that'd be crazy if that was the case, because we know that that's not, that's not what happens. 
we shouldn't give people false dichotomies. We should encourage them in the need to get going. My experience, and God knows I'm not a natural athlete, right? But after a bit, your brain adapts. It really needs to move. It needs to move faster and better and more. And and, and you find yourself, you know, exercising against your against your better judgment, almost, you know, including running on the ice and such, because it becomes so important. That, but we can't start people so they need to get there. We just keep encouraging them time and time again. And uh, just quickly, quickly, we have about a minute left. Um, looking at all of those factors that the Lancet Commission identified, do you uh, anticipate there might be of a, communi a communications challenge here in that there are so many uh, and people probably can't take on so many at one time? Um, is it worth kind of highlighting some for each individual? Yeah, I think if you don't individualize prescriptions, you won't get anywhere. But the, the way it boils down is live a good, happy life. Minimize your stress, get exercise, eat well, engage with your friends, uh, be moderate in your indulgences. And if you get dementia, you know, you've had a good life. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Rockwood. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Next, uh, we will welcome Dr. Sylvie Belleville professor in the psychology department at the Université de Montréal and a researcher at the research center of the Institut Universitaire de Gériatrie de Montréal. Dr. Belleville has been widely recognized for her work in the area of cognitive training for older adults and those at risk for dementia and on the prevention of age-related cognitive decline. Dr. Belleville holds a tier one Canada research chair on the Cognitive Neuroscience of Aging and Brain Plasticity. And she joins us now to tell us more. Welcome, Dr. Belda. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, and uh, I really thought that was we had such uh, interesting uh, conferences uh, yesterday and this morning. I'm really excited to be here. These are my disclosure. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So the concept of reserve, and the, I mean, I think the, the previous conference and the video, of course, is very well aligned with that, what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning. This concept of reserve is geared into this notion that inter-individual differences are important in aging. For instance, in this figure, next, uh, if you can tap, in this figure uh, from uh, the Betula Longitudinal Study, uh, you can see that uh, some uh, older adults uh, have cognitive performance at the level of that of their younger counterparts, even quite late in life. So here to the right uh, is higher performance, to the left is lower performance up our older adults. And, and there's quite a lot of overlap between uh, the performance of uh, some older adults and the performance of a younger ones. So what it means is that there is something about their brain that allows them to keep such a high level of cognition. Next slide, please. And this is the, the figure that the, the, the the data that was just shown by uh, Dr. Kenwood and that was uh, alluded to by Jay. Uh, and it's, it's another very important empirical foundation for, for cognitive reserve. And it is this notion uh, that comes from epidemiological studies showing that there's a range of modifiable factors or and environmental factors uh, that can account for a significant proportion of dementia cases. And you have here the percentage reduction uh, that is estimated in dementia prevalence for, for all of these particular factors if they were to be eliminated. And it's based on the estimates of the strength of the association, so how much, for instance, smoking is associated with dementia, and also on the prevalence of that risk in the population. Because, of course, if a risk is more prevalent in a population, it will have a larger effect at the populational level. Uh, and you can see how uh, this global effect uh, is tremendous to you. If we were to eliminate these fat risk factors, we could have an, a, a, a global effect up to 40 percent in dementia uh, risk in dementia reduction. Next slide. 
And again, that was shown by uh, Ken, but it shows uh, the hypothesis uh, in terms of the mechanisms that underlie these effects. Uh, and that's based on the updated Lancet Commission report. Uh, and what it was proposed is that uh, these factors would act through either reducing neuropathological damage, that's what I'm going to refer to today as brain maintenance, or by increasing or maintaining what uh, we call here cognitive reserve, and, and both mechanisms would play uh, to prevent dementia. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to just start by defining this concept of maintenance and cognitive reserve because there's quite a lot of uh, confusion in the literature and people are using these terms to, to refer to, uh, I would say, very different things. And I think it's important to agree on what we, we mean. Uh, I'll provide some evidence for maintenance, some evidence for cognitive reserve, and then discuss the implication for mechanisms, diagnosis, and management. Next slide. So these are uh, uh, definitions that are provided by work done uh, uh, through the collaboratory on research definition for reserve resilience in cognitive aging and dementia that is led by Yakov Stern. And uh, in this group, we are trying to come up with definitions uh, upon which people would agree so that we're talking about the same thing. So we would we define here brain maintenance as the relative absence of change in neural resources over time. So if you see uh, the figure to, to the right here, uh, you can see that age is associated with changes in brain structure or function. It is also associated with accumulation of uh, neuropathology. Uh, and when we talk about brain maintenance, we're really talking about the red line here where uh, in some individual, there would be uh, differences in terms of the relation between age and brain structure and function, changes in brain structure and function or pathology. Now, in turn, what cognitive reserve refers to is a property of the brain that allows for sustained cognitive performance in the face of age-related changes in brain and cells. So you do have changes in some individual, but the change does not predict the amount of cognitive symptoms or problems that this person has. So we here in this graph here, we it is cognitive reserve is, is shown as this green line that relates brain, the, the brain status and cognition. So they are complementary concepts. One refers to relative preservation of the brain, while the other refers to sustaining cognition in the face of brain changes. But cognitive reserve, this green line here, is most expressed in case when there's a failure of brain maintenance. You, if your brain is totally healthy, of course, you wouldn't need cognitive reserve to come into play. Uh, you can see here in this uh, graph that we also added uh, blue lines, modifiers. So what it refers to, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, is that these indi there, there are individual differences in maintenance and reserve, and they may be due to either uh, innate or lifetime exposure factors. So I'm going to talk more about lifetime exposure factors, but innate factors are also probably important. Next slide. <clears throat> okay. Oh, just that was just also to uh, remind people that you perhaps saw in the literature the, the notion of resistance and resilience. These are, uh, I would say, terms that are, have been used. Uh, resistance to refer to brain maintenance, resilience to refer most often to cognitive reserve. But in this presentation, we'll stick to brain maintenance and cognitive reserve. Another, next slide, another uh, issue we have to agree about is this notion of reserve proxy. Um, the reserve, reserve is a theoretical construct, it's a neurobiological construct, but it has been, it is not directly measured at this point because we don't really know how it is neurobiologically implemented. So it's approach. It's approached scientifically with what we call proxy. So we use those social behavioral characteristics, education, profession, simulating leisure, or lifetime questionnaires that allow us to measure lifetime exposure to knowledge, 
So these are really ways to scientifically approach reserve. Reserve is a neurobiological construct by definition, although it is modified by these uh, factors. Next slide. Let's dig a bit in this notion of brain maintenance, just to show you how this is expressed, or how we found we 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 found it uh, among uh, older adults. Next slide. So let me remind you that uh, maintenance uh, refers to this notion that some people better preserve the neurochemical, structural, or functional integrity of their brain. So there's a, a lack or postponement of age-related or pathological changes. And the difference occurs over time. It's not that you start with a healthier brain from uh, that you had a, all your life a healthier brain. It's just you resist, you, you're more uh, resistant to the effect of aging on, uh, in terms of its effect on pathology and on the brain structure and function. So for instance, in this uh, graph that you have to the right, uh, if you look at uh, the, the one that, that's called hippocampus, or B uh, graph, and the C ones, what you see here are an, uh, for the first annual change in hippocampal volume. So uh, you can see that with age, overall people have a reduction in their hippocampal volume, but the points refers to individuals. And you can see how at a particular age, for instance, 80 years of age, some people have very little hippocampal change and other have very large one. And the same for uh, the volume of the caudate uh, and uh, prefrontal white matter. So there's a lot of this variability that uh, is uh, expressed in terms of brain of brain changes. Next slide. <clears throat> That's also found when we're looking at CSF biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a study from uh, uh, a, a group that's sh with, with using the Wisconsin registry and CSF biomarkers. And essentially what it shows is that education uh, moderates the relationship between education uh, and age. And uh, here, for instance, we can see that people with older age have more of these biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, but this is much less the, the case in people with higher education. So uh, in these graphs, uh, you can see older ages in light gray, uh, and we can see that older at older age, there's more of these biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, uh, but particularly the, the one that reflects tau, uh, but it is not found in uh, those with higher education. That reflects a certain uh, uh, remarkable maintenance of uh, brain uh, integrity in the face of CSF biomarkers. Next slide, please. Again here, uh, these are uh, studies from the same group showing how uh, people here, that's not really uh, associated with education, but with the amount of cogn cognitively stimulating activities you've had during your life. So that's interesting. Uh, and it shows that uh, people who had high level of cognitive activity during their life show a remarkable uh, integrity of their uh, brain in terms of albiloid deposition relative to those who had lowest uh, cognitive activity during their life. And in the right figure, what it shows is that it interacts with ApoE4. So it's, it's the case, particularly for those who have a genetic risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's even more, I would say, encouraging in that uh, it's not uh, that the genetic risk uh, eliminates the positive effect of uh, a life, lifetime cognitive activity. On the contrary, um, it seems to be even more uh, important for those who have a genetic risk. Next slide. <clears throat> and because we're in a bilingual country, I thought that was interesting to br bring up this study. It's a study from Spain, it's not from Canada, but what is, uh, it shows is that uh, early bilingualism is also an important potential modifier uh, for brain maintenance. And this is uh, uh, found again in tau level, uh, where uh, it's found that uh, the relation between the level of tau and age is eliminated in people with early bilingualism relative to those who are monolingual or late bilingual. Next slide. So what it shows, and you can tap here, please, 
is that there's quite a bit of evidence for maintenance, uh, both in terms of the relation between age and brain and structure function and the relation between age and pathology. Uh, and also we found that there are psychosocial modifiers that influence uh, maintenance. So uh, having a stimulating uh, life cognitively, having had a, a higher level of education, bilingualism seem to modify the relation between age and uh, the brain. Um, next slide. So how about cognitive reserve? So if you go back to the previous slide, or maybe not, that's okay. Let's go to the next slide. So just a reminder that the concept of reserve was proposed to explain why the brain status is not a perfect predictor of cognition and why some individuals are resilient to the effect of age, brain aging, age-related neurodegenerative disease. So even though there is some indication that maintenance is present in many of these individuals, yet there are individuals who have those changes and there seems to be no, no not a perfect relation between brain status and cognition. And uh, these cognitive reserve would be intermediate factors that moderate the relationship between uh, brain status and cognition. Next slide, please. Okay, this is <laughs> early findings from David Bennett's group. It's it's really finding that struck the imagination and were very important to support the notion of reserve. And what it sh it shows actually is if you look at the 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 the, the global measure of postmortem AD pathology and its relation to cognition prior to death, because that, that's post-mortem AD pathology, how was cognition prior to death? There's an important moderation effect of psychosocial uh, net, so, social network on the left and education on the right, in that people who have had a high level of education or people who had a, 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 a with broader social uh, network uh, don't show such a strong effect of uh, AD pathology and cognition. So there's a globally an effect of AD pathology. As you can see, the more pathology you have, the worse your cognition was when you were younger. But it is highly modified by the level of education or the social network that you had. So that, that's extremely important. Uh, because it means that even though you have the pathology, there's something that occurs in your brain that allows you to uh, fight against uh, this pathology. And, and if you look at my blue arrows here, what it shows is that with, at a similar level of pathology, cognition can be quite different. And that seems to be related to what you've done during your life. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, that similar finding, a report with in vivo markers of pathology, so that's a, a level of, C of Abeta and Tau in the, C in the CSF. Uh, uh, that's uh, also based on brain volume and white matter intensity, a study by Prashanti Vemuri. And what, again, it shows, if you look at the different uh, uh, lines of different colors, if uh, your... Um, uh, reserve proxy score is higher, you can have the same level of pathology, but your performance on the mini mental state, which is a very well-known measure of short measure of cognition, is, is, is higher. Uh, and this is found at all level of biomarkers. So there seems to be a protective effect of, uh, of uh, reserve proxy uh, on the relation between pathology and cognition. Next slide. Well, I wanted to bring up this slide because Dr. Yaffe is going to talk later. And, and also this is a nice slide showing how uh, the same effect is observed when you look at a more diverse um, population or of a uh, sample of older adults. So this is a, a coming from the healthy BC study. And essentially it's the same thing. That is when you're looking at the uh, relation between um, pathology 
and uh, cognition. It is, uh, and that's in terms of uh, the, its effect on cognitive decline. Uh, there is an interaction uh, in that people with higher education uh, can sustain more uh, pathology uh, and uh, decline less. Next slide, please. One interesting finding is that this seems to be somehow related to where you are in the phase of the disease. Uh, what this slide shows is, is this positive effect of reserve proxy uh, is associated with an attenuated progression prior to the, the dementia phase. So if you look at uh, the, the first, the top uh, graph and the middle graph, you can show that those in purple can have, have a better, so they don't decline as much as those in green who have lower proxy uh, as measure, if you wish. But that's not the case when you look at people with dementia, uh, where here it's the reverse. People with higher proxy decline faster. And that's perhaps because it's following di the diagnosis. Next slide. And this, uh, this is not something that is entirely surprising. It's, it was actually predicted by Yakov Stern. And what Yakov Stern uh, reminded us is that this positive effect of reserve proxy uh, ver may very well vary as a function of disease age, because what we see is that decline is seen later in people with higher reserve because pathology is tolerated longer than in people with lower cognitive reserve. But there's a point at which pathology is too severe to be, is so, is so severe that the protective processes can no longer or are no longer sufficient uh, to, uh, to, to re to, re, to, to protect cognition. So at, at this particular stage, what will happen is you will see the effect more solidly based on neuropathology. Uh, so that would me it means that you will have your diagnosis later, but eventually uh, the rate of decline will be faster and you will reach people, and people with higher reserve will reach people with lower ones. So it's really like a, a decay in a sense in the uh, trajectory of uh, uh, the symptoms. Next slide. So uh, what we found here, uh, what I've described so far is considerable evidence for cognitive reserve and modifiers and a probably a, an optimal window of effects. So the effect seems to occur prior perhaps to the time at which uh, the brain is highly affected by the pathology. So when people are healthier in terms of their brain, when they have mild cognitive impairment, subjective decline, cognitive decline, that seems to be a phase where there's a lot of uh, neuroplasticity pr pr processes and, and, and compensatory processes. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So that comes to my uh, other question, which is how it is actually implemented in the brain. Why is it that some people can fight against the, the, the changes that occur during aging and during the disease. One, process, one hypothesis is that these people have a more uh, adapted uh, brain processes. They, are more, they have more flexible brain processes so that uh, they can rely more easily on alternative networks. And that's something that we've been looking at. Next slide. Um, in, in my own study, we looked at the data from the consortium for the early identification of Alzheimer's disease in Quebec. These are 300 older adults, most of them in the pre-dementia phase. And we use re as a reserve proxy the Bartos Fest questionnaire that looks at their level of education, but also how much they um, engage into stimulating leisure activities, their profession, physical activity. And that, that was a two-step process. We were interested in trying to understand what is particular about their brain that protects against uh, the hippocampal uh, atrophy in people at risk of dementia. So what we did is we were interested first to look at the activation of the brain when people are memorizing. So in the next, so next slide. So, uh, so 
as a first step, what, what are the activations that are engaged when people are memorizing and how is it different as a function of, it, of, of this reserve proxy questionnaire that I mentioned earlier? And we found that people with higher scores on that questionnaires, they seem to engage indeed at a higher level, a few regions, one and two of them were the left fusiform gyrus and the right temporal regions. And what is interesting is we then looked at whether these higher activation are actually protecting them against the detrimental effect of hippocampal atrophy on a face name memory test that they did that they, they, they completed in a different session. And we found that indeed people with higher temporal activation didn't show as much, didn't show an effect of the hippocampal volume reduction on their memory for uh, names associated with face. So what, what it means is that these higher activation of, of a region that is highly connected to the hippocampus seems to be uh, the process by which people uh, 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 become more resilient to the hippocampal atrophy when it comes to memorizing. Next slide. So that that brings uh, uh, this notion of the, 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 the importance of neuroplastic processes that has been proposed as a, a probably an important mechanism to account for differences in reserve and cognitive reserve uh, uh, and maintenance. So maintenance may involve preservation of neural resource, involve continuous repair and regeneration of the brain in response to damage. Uh, and cognitive reserve may involve the capacity to engage more flexible brain networks. So, and that's a dynamic process. That's something that occurs probably throughout life, but it becomes more critical in aging because that's the time that that's a period when there's neurodegeneration that occurs. And there are also other mechanisms and they, they are, these are extremely important and they are probably interacting with these neuroplastic processes. There's a lot of work to be done to better understand these. So um, I don't know how much I have left, but let's, con next slide please. <laughs> Just uh, then uh, getting to implications for mechanisms, diagnosis and management. Next slide. <clears throat> Cognitive reserve complicates the use of biomarkers as a sole basis for diagnosis, particularly in asymptomatic people. What it means is you can have uh, positive biomarkers of the disease, but you not have any symptoms. And that really comes to this notion of what is a disease. Is a disease reflected by the fact that you're positive on a biomarker of this disease, or is it really uh, that it has an impact on your life, that it has an impact on your cognition? So if you can die with uh, biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease with no symptoms, are you are we talking about the same thing as a person who has the symptoms? What is really happening there? I think that that really comes to the complexity of uh, using biomarkers as toll basis. The other thing that remains, and that has, I think that's very important, it remains to be elucidated, is the relation between maintenance and reserve. Um, interestingly, you've seen it's associated with very similar modifiers and perhaps mechanisms. Uh, why does it why do people maintain their brain, others not? And are these different people? Uh, is it, does it occur in different phases? Do they have it in different triggers? We don't know. These are very important questions. And, and also, we, we, that there's, it may, would make sense that different modifiers might have impact on different markers of pathology. For instance, physical activity may have impact on uh, on, on the vascular health of the brain, whereas uh, education might have more impact on the tau, for instance. But these are uh, important uh, aspects to look at it more carefully. Next slide. The positive aspect of the cognitive reserve uh, data is that it, it can have tremendous implication for interventions. And, and one can think that you could develop various types of pharmacological or non-pharmacological intervention to increase cognitive reserve. And, and there has been some uh, studies out there trying to look at stress reduction, TMS, sleep intervention to look at uh, whether we can increase cognitive reserves. Next slide. In our own lab, we've used 
cognitive intervention uh, quite a lot. So we've developed a very important expertise. And this is a study published published in, in JAGS, which showed that uh, with, co with cognitive training, that's memory training, where you teach people how to better encode information, you teach them strategies, how to better pay attention. Uh, that's in people with mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we observed uh, a positive effect on delayed memory for those who were enrolled in cognitive training relative to psychosocial intervention or no contact. And it was the positive effect was sustained over six months. There was also important effect on the brain with more activated regions uh, following the intervention. Recently, we just uh, called back these people and we measured their cognition five years later, and we found a positive effect on the, on, on the MOCA that was sustained five years following this very short information. So we're very, excited about that. So it might mean that these people have engaged processes that preserve somehow their function over the long time. Next slide. And as a proof of concept, we were also interested in trying to see whether cognitive training might restore the temporal activation reduction that we had observed in the prior study in low education people. So remember that low education people don't seem to activate as much their uh, temporal lobe when they are memorizing uh, associations. And we found the same thing here in this different group of individuals with subjective cognitive decline. But interestingly, uh, and you have this here in, in blue, you can see that they do differ from high education people prior to intervention, but after intervention, they uh, recuperate, so they restore their temporal lobe activation to a large degree. The next slide. So that motivates us to try to develop new, more engaging intervention, a broader type of intervention that could be used in community setup. And that's a study for, with, that we, that we do with a, a large team from across Canada within CCNA. And we use both leisure activities, music learning, uh, learning a second language, we saw it was important. Uh, combined with cognitive training to try to see whether we can have a neuroprotective effect in those individuals and we try to target people with low reserves, that is people with lower education. Next slide. And again, with a more, I would say, uh, positive uh, uh, view, uh, we, we, we did start this uh, very important Ken Thumbs Up study, which is part of the Worldwide Finger, uh, where we are trying to look at these different risk factors that uh, Jay and Ken uh, talked to you about earlier and try to personalize an intervention that would both uh, educate people on how these these different risk factors uh, uh, play, and also what are the best strategies to improve their risk. So that would be based on their personalized risk factor, risk profile. Next slide. So to conclude, research on Alzheimer's disease have essentially, or most, most in large part, focus on what I would call negative driving forces. So the pathology, the brain changes that occur, with aging here, what I want to argue is that uh, we need to perhaps bring back in the field uh, the positive driving forces because as uh, we, we, we've start to learn, there is really a combat here, a fight between those uh, different forces. And, and though we need to better understand their respective role in the disease, I think that it's only, and you can tap, <laughs> It's only by reducing, both reducing negative driving forces, tap again, and increasing the positive driving forces that I think we can uh, win the battle against Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of questions and uh... I think even though we can't see you live, we're going to uh, at least have a picture of you so that we know who I'm talking to. Uh, and you know, I find this cognitive reserve training really fascinating. And it, it seems to me that, that you know, as you explore this, 
one of the very critical things would be to make it attractive for people to do in the same way that I think exercise has caught on to some degree so that, you know, people buy running sneakers and they dress for exercise and mm. it's, it's a good thing. Um, do you think that that's uh, right, that it, that it would be very important to make cognitive training as attractive as uh, exercise can be? Absolutely. And I've, I've done a lot of work on cognitive training. And what I realize is that people vary in, in how they are attracted to different types of cognitive training. Um, and, and the way we constructed it so far was more, I would say, adapted to people with higher education because it's like in a cool school format, people sit, they learn strategies. So it's, uh, and it wasn't that well adapted in, in, in our view to people with, perhaps from different or more diverse uh, group of individuals. And uh, that's why we, with CCN 1810, we were so interested in trying to combine cognitive formal, I would say cognitive training, so more classical types of cognitive training with leisure activities. And leisure by definition has to be fun. And what is interesting also in this particular study is we use what we call a preference trial. So people can select, in real life, people select their leisure. Right? They don't go to leisures that they don't like. Um, right. So we had these two leisures. We have, uh, I mean, that's a leisure, uh, you know, Spanish learning. I mean, people love it. We people want to go to Spanish because they can select either Spanish or music. They really want to go to Spanish because uh, perhaps they want to go to Mexico and <laughs> have fun on the beach. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they, they, it's the, the idea here was really to bring pleasure to this notion of cognitive training. It's not only something that you do repetitively in front of a computer. It's something also that's engaging, that involves talking with other people. So, you yeah, know, I think you're it, very yeah. right. It, it makes it uh, so much more attractive than simply saying, here's a list of risks, you deal with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and instead, I mean, that, I don't think that's going to work. I think what will work is exactly what you just said. If you make it attractive, people will come and do it. I have another question about this training, and that is, how rigorous uh, does it have to be? Yesterday, we heard that, you know, simply a casual walk isn't enough. You've got to huff and puff and get your cardio going. Is that mm. true of cognitive training as well? That's a very good point. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I just analyzed the data from a big multi-domain intervention. Look at, at what we, do, we call dose effect. In pharmacology, everybody's looking at dose effect. When is the dose? And here dose is how much of the cognitive training you do. When is it no longer necessary to you know, add doses because at some point people lose motivation? And we found that the dose effect is actually much less than, than the total dose that people give usually in these uh, cognitive training programs. So we, we need to do a better job as, at trying to find the right dose for the right person. And, and for instance, we, it may depend, frail people need more dose of cognitive training than people who are more robust. That comes a little bit to the notion that Ken Rockwood said earlier, that frailty might be an important component. So yes, you're, you're right. There, there's a, there seems to be like an optimal dose that's not necessarily the largest you get. Hmm. Does, um, if people are suffering, uh, maybe that's not the right word, people are have mild cognitive uh, decline, can that affect motivation, which in turn would make it more <laughs> difficult to train? Well, we found that it increases motivation, on the contrary. Really? Because it, well, uh, no, I, don't, I wouldn't say that we <laughs> that we uh, scientifically measure motivation. What we found, though, we've, we've done that with people with MCI, our hypothesis is that these people are highly motivated because they have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, they know they are at a higher risk of dementia. We have no problem to recruit people with mild cognitive impairment in our cognitive training. They're extremely motivated. People also with subjective cognitive decline. We've been interested in this group of individuals who don't show decline when you measure them objectively, but they have a concern about their memory. They have the impression their memory is not as good as it used to be, and it worries them. 
these people are also extremely motivated to be enrolled into these kinds of programs. It's fascinating stuff. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beville. Thank you. We are now going to take a short break, 15 minutes, and we will continue with our next two speakers at that time. Reach the bowls that are always too high for me. Okay. Leonard and I have been together for over 35 years. Leonard is my true love. We've been through a lot together. I would say, even though Leonard was diagnosed at the end of 2016, I was noticing things for at least three years, maybe five years before that. Some of the things that I was noticing about Leonard were a little bit obscure. You know, they would be things like we would have something planned to go out for an evening and it would be, he just would not remember at all. So I would interpret that as all good wives do, that he just wasn't being thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> and that he was not, it wasn't important to him. There was something really odd about it because Leonard was professional and a senior leader in the community and it seemed like things were slipping. One of the other things I was noticing was that he was really acting out his dreams at night and, and kind of sometimes falling out of bed, sometimes accidentally hitting me. And I remember asking him to talk to his doctor about that at his next checkup and, you know, he would forget different things. So there were a lot of things that weren't connected. They seemed very random, but they started to add up. Yeah. Doesn't it smell good? Sometimes people will say, if they're living with somebody with dementia, I'm watching them disappear or I'm watching everything they are go away. That's not my experience at all. I'm watching it change, but you know, Leonard will always be a poet. He will always be one of the few good men with real heart and that empathy and that kindness and all the things that I fell in love with initially, I'm still in love with now, but it's different. Yeah, it's different. What I can tell other people who may be experiencing a little bit of what I'm going through is that love never goes away. And you know that expression, love is love is love? It really is true. It alters, it changes its form. But I mean, that happens in life anyway. So I think with dementia, it's an added component of it. But if you are connected, you're still gonna be that way. Thank you, Madam. Beauty. I think it's important for me to share my story because we can right now. Leonard is in early stage dementia and he's very self-reflective. And so what a great opportunity to be able to communicate to people about what that experience is like. And I just want to stand beside him. And if there's any way that I can help, you know, I want to be there for that. That uh, is a very moving video and instructive too, not just uh, seeing how Leonard is, but in particular seeing how Naomi reacts to that. And, you know, her line, love is love is love, is uh, something to remember. And, you know, frankly, sometimes difficult for people who are dealing with a partner who has, as in Leonard's case, uh, early dementia. And, uh, you know, this is, this is an important part of what we're talking about today is that we're trying to come to grips with the myriad forms that Alzheimer's and other dementias take. But we, and we're looking indeed at the brain science underlying it, but we can never forget that caregivers have an enormous role, a hugely important role, and we must always remember to support them as much as we possibly can. I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Barnes, Professor of Gerontology and Geriatric Medicine at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And the Rush Center has come up more than once in, in today's talks. Dr. Barnes' research interests include disparities in chronic diseases of aging, cognitive decline, and risk factors for Alzheimer's, and she advocates a lot for recruitment of underrepresented groups into clinical studies. 
Dr. Barnes has also received numerous awards and fellowships. Welcome, Dr. Barnes. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to, um, to present today. Um, it's been a really uh, great symposium, and I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the impact of this disease in different populations. Um, Okay, so let's just start off to um, framing the question that we are uh, interested in. Why is diversity and inclusion important for Alzheimer's? Well, as you've heard over the past uh, day and a half, uh, Alzheimer's dementia is one of the most feared diseases of old age. Worldwide, ar around 50 million people have dementia and by 2030, that number is projected to increase to 82 million. Among the leading causes of death, it's the only one that cannot be prevented, slowed, or cured yet. And side by side with this projection is the changing demographics of the, of the U.S. population. So I do research in the U.S. and you know we have it's a very multicultural society. Um, similar to, to Canada, but the demographic profile of the U.S. is becoming increasingly diverse. This slide shows data from the U.S. Census with population projections through 2050 for different racial and ethnic groups. And what you can see is that minorities will make up the largest segment of the adult U.S. population in 2050, and Hispanics will have the most dramatic increase. This demographic shift is important because minority populations, African-Americans and Latinos in particular, are disproportionately burdened by Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment. In fact, the Alzheimer's Association estimates that African-Americans are about two times more likely than whites to have Alzheimer's disease. And data also indicates that they are often diagnosed later in the course of disease. Um, and they are less likely to be prescribed Alzheimer's medications. And this is also true for, for Latinos. They are about one and a half times more likely to have the disease than whites and, um, and face a similar uh, picture of being diagnosed later and um, less likely to be prescribed medications. We also know that the financial burden is tremendous for this disease, not only for the person experiencing it, for, but for the caregiver as well. And for example, it is estimated that Alzheimer's will cost Latino families a total of $2.3 trillion by 2060. So um, we have you know, relatively recent data um, from Kaiser, which is a large uh, managed care consortium based in Northern California. And this study was done by Maeda and colleagues in 2016. And they looked at age-adjusted dementia incidence rates by race and ethnicity from January 2000 to December 2013. In over 270,000 healthcare members over the age of 64. And consistent with prior studies, they showed that African Americans had a higher incidence of dementia um, than any other racial ethnic group. Um, and the nice thing about this study is that typically when we look at health disparities for uh, this condition, most studies compare African-Americans and whites. That's where we have the most data. There's an emerging literature uh, with Latinos, so we're getting more and more studies that compare Latinos to whites. But we very rarely see data on American Indian and Alaska Native or Pacific Islanders or, or Asian Americans. So this uh, study had enough people in their database to be able to look at the rates across different races and ethnicities. And you know what you can see is that the American Indian and Alaska Natives they weren't that far behind the African-Americans in risk. Latinos, Pacific Islanders were about intermediate with, uh, with white individuals, but interestingly, Asians actually had um, 
a decreased risk of, of Alzheimer's. You know, and you know, these are very broad categories, obviously. We know that even within these categories, we can subset down to different cultural groups, different ethnicities. Um, but this data is the best that we have right now. And it's really a start to us to kind of see that there are different patterns across race and ethnicity when it comes to this, to, to this disease. Now, we also have data from our own study um, where we, um, at Rush, where we have uh, Blacks and whites who we recruited from our memory clinic who uh, had a diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease dementia, and then they died and came to autopsy, we were able to examine their brain under a uh, microscope to look at the different types of pathology. And as, you, as you've heard over the course of the uh, symposium, we know that uh, most people who die with dementia have mixed pathology in their brain. So, you know, in 1906, when Dr. Um, Alzheimer discovered, you know, the plaques and tangles we, we call amyloid and tau, we, um, that's still the hallmark feature of the disease, but we now know that you can have many different types of pathology in your brain as a cause of your dementia. And in this study, we were comparing um, blacks and whites who died and came to autopsy. And we found that um, when we looked at whites, um, the, the, the cause of their dementia was much more likely to be the, the pure um, sort of amyloid and tau, you know, and some people had, you know, amyloid and tau mixed with infarcts, but that was pretty, you know, the, the dominant picture for whites. In contrast, the, the picture we saw for, for Blacks with Alzheimer's dementia was a little different. They were much more likely to have mixed pathology. So this red pie slice here, um, you can see it's much bigger than the pie slice for whites. So, um, you know, this is just telling us, this is emerging literature to tell us that, you know, everything that we have been learning to date has really been based on studies of predominantly white populations. And so we are making assumptions about this disease based on who is in our study. But when we start to get more uh, cultural groups involved in the research, we see that we don't always get the same picture um, that, we, that we think we're working with. And so, you know, despite the advancement in novel initiatives to improve outreach and recruitment, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research inclusion rates for racial and ethnic minorities and other historically marginalized populations remain low. You know, and these disparities are really, they're against a backdrop of non-inclusion and underrepresentation of minorities in this type of research. And this is despite the fact that the, the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 um, which directed the NIH to establish guidelines for inclusion of women and minorities in clinical research and a policy that was issued in 2001 by the NIH regarding or requiring clinical research grantees to address inclusion of women and minorities, we still see an under-inclusion of these different populations. You know, and so as we move within the field towards a biological definition of Alzheimer's disease in which the disease is defined by its underlying pathologic processes that can be, you know, documented currently um, very well through postmortem examination, but more and more we, we're learning that we can also document the underlying pathology through biomarkers while people are still living, we need to be concerned that the individuals who are most at risk um, are under included in these clinical studies. So this slide is from a recent study that looked at willingness to uh, be contacted or to engage in studies that involve procedures typical of Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. And so um, it's showing you that uh, data for whites are in the blue, uh, non-Hispanic Asians are in the orange, and Hispanics are in sort of the grayish color, and non-Hispanic Blacks are in the yellow color. And what you can see is that there's different, you know, protocols or procedures for clinical research, and diverse older adults were less willing to be contacted for um, Alzheimer's disease research studies, particularly for those studies that involve invasive procedures. So you see sort of the biggest difference were PET scans, um, lumbar puncture, and autopsy. 
you know, and we have to, you know, ask ourselves, you know, why is this? Well, the Alzheimer's uh, Association uh, recently released their 2021 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures. And, um, you know, through a, a series of different focus groups with uh, different racial and ethnic groups, they found that discrimination is a barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care. And the populations listed below reported discrimination when seeking health care. You can see half of Black Americans reported uh, discrimination, 42% of Native Americans. And so this is for seeking health care. And you can imagine, you know, we as researchers, medical researchers who are connected to, to health care, you know, in, in some fashion, you know, we're going to face the same types of barriers if people are um, having bad experiences and feeling um, maybe mistreated in some some way um, in the healthcare setting, you can just imagine the barriers that we're going to face in trying to get people to engage in research studies. Um, and, and we've seen that across the board. So, you know, the studies of, of disparities, you know, so far that we know about, that really represents our best knowledge of this higher risk that we're seeing in the diverse populations when it comes to dementia. But, you know, there are challenges in interpreting this higher risk. Um, and we need to take those, you know, think about those challenges when we're really evaluating the data. And the way that we currently uh, make the diagnosis is heavily reliant on performance on neuropsychological tests. Um, and as you've heard, you know, people are generally given a comprehensive battery of tests that measure a number of different cognitive domains of cognitive function and performance on these tests, you know, determines whether or not you have impairment. But we know from many cognitive aging studies that older racial and ethnic minorities tend to perform at lower levels on these cognitive function tests on average than older non-Hispanic whites. And we also know that performance is heavily influenced by multiple cultural and social attributes outside of cognition itself. And many of these factors happen to also vary by race and ethnicity. So things like socioeconomic status, quality of education, language differences, among others. And this can present challenges for interpreting low performance because it's not always entirely clear if low performance is due to disease or because of these other, other factors that vary by race and ethnicity. So one way to get around this challenge is to use longitudinal designs um, in which you examine a person repeatedly over time. This is a strong approach in studying health disparities because it allows you to to really see how cognitive function changes over time. And since aging is fundamentally a process of change over time, it makes sense to use a study design where you can actually measure the aging process. But most studies that we have, you know, currently they just look at cognition once, you know, one time, one point in time. Another important design feature of a longitudinal design is that um, you're able to control and hold constant the level of function that a person starts with, and each person start, serves as their own control. So you're measuring how a person changes over time based on where they started. And rather than comparing people that may vary on any number of different characteristics that I just showed you, you're comparing a person to themselves, to where they started. And so in using this type of design, what we try to do is to identify risk factors, either genetic or environmental, and learn how the risk factors associate with changing cognition over time, with um, uh, development of disease, with the underlying uh, pathology that we can measure either um, at the time of autopsy or in the brain through imaging. And in this way, we're able to, um, to develop strategies to prevent Alzheimer's, either by modifying lifestyle behaviors, which you heard a little bit about yesterday, or identifying druggable targets so that we can develop medications. So what is needed to do a study like this in, in a diverse population where you, know, you, you don't have a lot of people who are um, willing to be in these types of studies? Well, you need a large 
uh, you meet lots of people, first of all, and you know who don't have dementia, um, because once you have dementia, it's really hard to figure out what the risk factors are. And you need people who will agree to um, yearly memory testing um, because the disease is slowly progressive. So, you know, you want to be able to catch it when people develop, develop the disease. And you want people who will agree to uh, answer questions about their life, their behaviors, their feelings, their attitudes, so that you can identify these risk factors. And you, you know, you know, you need people to donate blood uh, for genetic testing and ultimately to donate their brain at the time of death. And also you need to be able to remove these common barriers to participation that we know exist, you know, for older adults in general, but also for, for these diverse populations. And so, you know, I have a study that I've been um, doing in, in Chicago since 2004, and I really, I want to just use it as um, an example to, uh, to show you how important it is to take the cultural background and the social context that a person lives in into consideration. So no matter what cultural background you're looking at, I think, you know, that these concepts um, will be, you know, very similar. So just to give you a little bit of background on the study, and then I'll show you some of the data, um, we started the study in 2004, and it consists um, currently of about 800 African Americans who enroll without dementia um, at the time of the first baseline visit. Um, they have to be at least 65 years and, and older, and they're recruited primarily from the community, um, from churches, senior buildings, and organizations um, in Chicago that cater to older African Americans. And all participants agreed to be tested in their home every year um, with you know, a, a comprehensive battery of cognitive uh, function tests, a risk factor assessment, and, and everyone gives blood. We have been following people, um, like I say, since 2004, and the follow-up rate is very good, ab above 90% among survivors, and we're starting years 16 to 20 currently. Over time, about 10% have developed Alzheimer's dementia. And in 2011, we started recruiting for a brain autopsy uh, because there are very, very few studies that have um, data on brain tissue in, um, in, in African Americans in any diverse population, um, period. Most of the data on, um, on uh, neuropathology is from studies of predominantly uh, white samples. You know, and because this is a diverse population that has a lot of um, bad experiences with the healthcare and with, with, with research in general, we use a very community-centered recruitment and retention approach um, where we, you know, build trust, we build relationships with people in the community, and we're constantly in the community, um, you know, um, giving back and, you know, and, and getting feedback on what we're doing and, and getting advice about how to move forward. You know, and so this study, um, it's, it's, it's all African American, so we're able to really understand within race heterogeneity. But there are questions that we want to understand uh, and compare across race. And so in that um, instance, we have two other studies at Rush, and, and I know you've heard a few, um, you've seen Rush a few times throughout these two days. So most of that data is coming from these other two studies, and that's the Religious Order Study and the Rush Memory and Aging Project. And these are two cohort studies of aging and Alzheimer's that have been going on for 20 plus years. And it, they consist of over 3,000 older, mostly uh, white individuals who enroll without um, known dementia from across the USA. And they all agree to annual uh, detailed clinical evaluations, uh, just like the study that I just showed you. But the, the one difference between these studies and mine is that they also have to agree to organ donation at death as a condition of entry. So, you know, there's like 1,300 brains from this study um, because of that requirement. And the important thing is that there's significant overlap and risk factors between my study called MARS and, um, and these two studies. And we use the same harmonized cognitive battery so that we can merge the data and look across race to understand racial differences in addition to understanding within race differences. And so when you look at people over time, you get a picture like this. This is just showing you a spaghetti plot of a random sample of blacks and whites who 
um, are, you know, at different ages and they are followed for, uh, you know, different amounts of time. So the length of the line is how long people were followed, you know, anywhere from two years, you know, up to uh, probably 10 years. And the red lines are uh, whites, white individuals, and the, the black lines represent black individuals. And what you can see is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in how people change over time. You know, so you have wide individual differences in where people start. Some people start off really low. Also, this is our cognitive function on this axis. And so higher numbers are better and lower numbers are worse. And so some people start off low and they decline very quickly. You know, others start off higher and they either stay sort of stable or they might get a little bit better over time. So you have a lot of variability in how people are aging over time. But when you uh, smooth out this, all of this, the spaghetti plot and put it um, into a mixed effects model, you see a pattern that is very interesting. And so here I'm showing you um, data from our studies comparing blacks and whites on two different um, types of, of cognitive function tests. This top panel is for semantic memory and this bottom panel is for perceptual speed tests. So these are tests of, of general knowledge and these are tests of you know, speed tests to see how fast you can process information. And I'm showing you there's two lines, two sets of lines on each uh, panel. So if we look at this panel first, the green lines are, are whites. So whites who started the study um, at different ages and were followed for five years. And then blacks who are, you know also started the study and then were followed. And what you see right away is that the, the lines for whites are higher. So whites are starting off at a higher level. But if you look at the, the slope of the curve of the, of the lines, they are essentially parallel suggesting that there's really no change in how people are, are, there's no difference in how people are changing over time. So even though whites start out higher on semantic memory tests and perceptual speed tests, over time, people are changing pretty much the same, except for out here at very old ages, it looks like whites are actually declining faster. Um, and this is probably, you know, consistent with some of the data that you just heard about the cognitive reserve. Once people with more cognitive reserve hit that level, they decline, you know, really quickly. Now, we've also shown this in another one of our cohort studies, a population-based sample called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. And this, this study consists of over 10,000 Blacks and whites who um, live in three contiguous areas neighborhood areas in Chicago. And so it's population based. So it's a representative sample of people in the Chicago area. Um, and what you see is a very similar pattern. So here I have um, performance is plotted, you know, on this axis. So higher scores are better, negative is, is worse. And you can see there's two lines. So these are whites who started the study at age 68 and they were followed for 10 years. And these are blacks who started at age 68 and were followed for 10 years. And you see that whites have a higher level of performance on these cognitive function tests than blacks, but the lines are parallel. They are not changing any faster. And so if you, you know, just do the thought experiment, if blacks have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, you really might expect that they would decline faster, that these curves would not be parallel. But it looks like they are you know, they're not declining any faster, whether they start the study at age 68, at 73, or 78. So um, the question then becomes, why do we have these level differences? And are the level differences the reason for this increased risk of, of Alzheimer's disease? And so, you know, what we've tried to do in the study is to identify uh, risk factors, those that are potentially modifiable, because you want to be able to intervene and, you know, and stop this decline so that people don't eventually you know, develop Alzheimer's. And we've published a number of different uh, risk factors. I'm sure you know, you've know you heard of many of these um, either you know, in the literature or, or throughout the, the day and a half of the presentations. Um, and some of these factors increase your risk for Alzheimer's and some of these decrease your risk. 
And, you know, when we compare blacks and whites, you know, we find that some of these operate the same across race. So, for example, we know um, from many studies in whites that um, cognitive activity is protective. So people who engage in more cognitively stimulating activities um, have a slower rate of decline and a lower risk of Alzheimer's. And this is true for African-Americans as well. So this risk factor is really operating the same. It's protective for both uh, blacks and whites, despite there being differences and the level of cognitive activity. Same for social activity. We have found that those uh, participants who report being more socially engaged, having a, 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 a bigger life space, greater purpose in life, all of these things are protective against decline and, and your risk of Alzheimer's, regardless of, of your race and ethnicity. And physical activity is also uh, similarly protective. Um, people who do um, you know, more physically um, active or, or engage in more physical activity um, seem to be um, to have a lower risk of, 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 of the disease and a slower rate of decline, regardless of race and ethnicity. But what I am particularly interested in is, you know, since we have this increased risk um, in, in African-Americans, are there factors that may be uniquely relevant to African-Americans that we can understand because it might represent a strategy to slow decline and ultimately prevent dementia. And it also may provide a window into understanding health disparities for other populations that we, that we are studying. And so I'm going to give you just a few examples of some of the risk factors that we're finding that seem to play a role um, in African Americans, you know, and and you know we can think about other cultures um, as well because we all know that we have different cultural experiences and different you know different things that have had an impact on our on our upbringing. So one of the 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 really important um, pieces of lived experience for older African Americans in the U.S. is what something called the Great Migration. We know that from 1916 to about 1970, uh, during this time of the Great Migration, it's estimated that some six million Black Southerners relocated to urban areas in the North and the West. And we just asked people a very simple question, where were you born and where were you living at age 12? And then we measure their cognition, um, you know, in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And what we find is represented here on this slide. So um, here is the scores on the on the cognitive function test. So again, higher numbers are better, negative numbers are worse. And uh, the red bars show uh, the African Americans who reported they were born in the South or living in the South at age 12. And you can see that they have lower performance than those African Americans who were born in the North or living in the North at age 12. Now, everyone's living in Chicago now in their, in their late you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but this is their early life experience of when they were born. And when we measure their cognition, we can see that there is an association between where you were born in your early life or living in your early life and how you perform on these cognitive function tests. Now, there's a lot going on, you know, in people who live in the South versus the North. It could be diet. It could be education. But one of the things that we know is well, there's a real difference between the South and the North in these older adults' lives is um, the education uh, differences, right? So we know that um, uh, segregated schooling was the law in the US until 1954 when Brown versus Board of Education outlawed school segregation. And so we asked our participants, you know, did you attend a legally segregated school? And if so, um, you know, for how long? And then we measured their cognition and we found something very interesting. Um, so here I'm showing you uh, data broken out by um, where people lived um, in early life and whether or not they attended a segregated school. So we didn't find that segregation itself impacted cognition, but we did find that where you live, if you lived in the South and you attended a segregated school, that that did have a profound impact on how you performed on our tests. So these are people who were born in the North and they're performing, um, as you saw on the other slide, a little bit better than people born in the South. These two lines represent people who were born in the South. And we expected that people born in the South who 
who attended a legally segregated school here would have performed the worst because we know that from from records that segregated schools had worse, uh, you know, poor quality, uh, they had lower resources, you know, maybe uh, poor quality uh, teachers. But what we find actually is that it was the people who attended legally desegregated schools, this group here, that actually performed the worst. And I put a picture up here to kind of show you, you know, remind you what was going on at that time, you know, where we had, you know, little black children integrating these schools in a really toxic, uh, in, in toxic environments where they weren't wanted. And that could have served as a stressor, an early life stressor in, in, in these uh people's lives. And we know from studies in whites that early life stress is, is a very important uh, marker of late life cognition. So this is an example of how this is also, this cultural um, context is also maybe affecting um, older African-Americans as they age. Um, and, you know, I'm sure everyone knows the, the the context, social context that's going on in the U.S. currently and across the world. Really, is now a worldwide phenomenon where people are really awakening to the social injustice and the inequity that uh, diverse populations live under. And we can ask people about their experiences with stress, you know. And when we find that people who report, you know, more stress have a faster rate of cognitive decline. So shown in this line here. Um, and, you know, and stressors are associated with, you know, depression, anxiety, financial problems, all the things that you would think about. And so people who are reporting more stress in our studies have faster rates of decline than people who are reporting less stress. You know, and we are interested in particular types of stress, right? So this is just general stress, but we know that um, discrimination is an important psychosocial stressor for African-Americans, and it has links to numerous adverse health outcomes. And some studies have found that it partially explains disparities in health. So we're looking at people who are now in their, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and they would have come uh, of age during a time in the U.S. when, you know, discrimination was was the law, right? And it was just everywhere. And so now we're we have them in our studies, and we want to understand how did those early life experiences, how could that have an impact? on your aging and how you're presenting now when we measure your cognition. And what we find is that those participants, we ask them questions about experiences of discrimination using a validated scale that's been used in hundreds of studies. Those participants who report more experiences of discrimination tend to perform worse on our memory and thinking tests. They show changes in the brain on MRI in areas that we know are responsible for trust. And we also see that um, that people who report more dis, uh, discrimination have higher inflammation in the blood. So here I'm showing you on this slide that, you know, it's like a dose response curve. So people who report um, uh, more discrimination actually have higher, higher levels of something we can measure in the blood called C-reactive protein, which is um, a marker of inflammation. And so it suggests that inflammation could be a potential mechanism linking these um, adverse experiences to, um, to poor cognition and maybe risk of, of Alzheimer's disease in our diverse populations. So I, I, I bring us back to the question that we started with, you know, why is diversity and inclusion important for Alzheimer's? You know, I hope that, you know, you know even though I focused in on one particular uh, population, I hope that you can, you know, sort of extrapolate and, and, and imagine that, you know, these different uh, cultural groups have their own sets of experiences, you know, either from early life or, or currently, you know, we know there's all of this, this hate crime now going on currently for, for Asian Americans, for example, you know, and these things are stressors that, are, can, you know, can impact how people age. It can impact how, um, how this disease manifests in, in, in different groups. And so we need to be more inclusive to ensure health equity, to ensure that as we race for a cure for this terrible, devastating disease. We are not just solely focused on one population. Just like in the old days when all research was only done in men and we started to find out that, hey, some of these medicines don't work the same in women. 
It's the same thing when it comes to, to diversity across race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, you know, gender, you know, all of these things matter and they, and they play a part in the disease. But currently, all of our knowledge base is really being uh, learned from uh, a single population. And so we know that older adults from, from some of these minoritized pop populations are at higher risk of Alzheimer's. And most research to understand the cause of dementia or treatment for the disease do not include these populations. And what we're finding is that some risk factors are the same, you know, especially some of the protective risk factors for these diverse populations. But there's others that are unique and need to be considered to understand their role in, in the disease. I just like to acknowledge um, our funders for, for the work that I, I described today and our participants um, who are giving and, you know, so altruistic have been in our studies and, you know, remain in our studies, you know, most times until death, until death so that we can get their brain and learn so much more about this disease. And without them, we wouldn't have half of the knowledge that we have now. And, you know, of course, this work is a team effort. And I would really like to acknowledge my um, colleagues at the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barnes. Uh, fascinating and actually distressing talk when you realize, I mean, there's a, a, a cruel sort of irony here in that you have difficulty recruiting uh, African-Americans for the very reasons that uh, alter their risk of, of dementia and Alzheimer's. Right. And, and you wanna get at that answer, but you're fighting the same kind of battle. Um, so you've shown, at least to me, really clearly that the early experiences uh, in the segregate era of segregation are having impacts on adults now. But um, as you pointed out, there's plenty of racism in uh, not just the United States, but we have it here too in Canada. Do you fear that it could be having similar effects on young people now when they turn 60 and 70? That's a great question. I, I think it, it can. I think it's an enduring um, psychosocial stressor, no matter what your age. Um, you know, and uh, most of the research actually comes from younger adults. When you look at discrimination and adverse health outcomes, it you know affects all types of, of, of health. Um, you know, diabetes, uh, hypertension, you know, mental health. Most of the research comes from young adults. We're just now really starting to look at it in older adults. And so I think that, you know, we are in for a very scary ride if we don't change how we treat each other and, and you know, and the social structures under which we live that allow this discrimination to go on. It's also fascinating that if you compare whites and blacks, uh, let's say starting at the age of 60, as the, their cogn cognition declines, it declines at the same rate, which uh, suggests that the impact of things like uh, legally desegregated schools back in the day, um, it's things like that that happen in earlier life that really set the, the difference between where people start before they start to decline. Exactly, that's, that's exactly the point. There are all of these things, these factors that go into um, where people start off when we measure their cognition. And we usually don't even take those things into account. The, the one thing we do look at is education. How many years of education do you have? And we try to adjust for that. But we know that there's differences in quality of education that we're not capturing, right? And so there are just other factors that are also playing a part in, in, in the lived experience that we need to understand where people were born, you know, whether or not they attended a, a segregated school, what type of, of quality of education they had. We also know that African-Americans during that time, you know, they went to school, but only on certain days, you know? And so you, you compare, you bring people into the clinic and you're comparing them, you're comparing apples and oranges really, you know, until we really can start asking some of these social determinant questions, we're not gonna understand why there's these huge level differences. Uh, we have uh, time for maybe one more question. And you mentioned that some of the risk factors are, are similar between different racial groups. Some are different. Could 
Could you maybe give us an idea of some risk factors for African Americans that might differ from other groups in the U.S.? So, you know, so far, the ones that we have found that are different are the ones that we don't measure well in whites. So it's ones that are picking up these social experiences. Um, you know, we can, with our scale that we have with discrimination, we actually can ask that question in whites because it doesn't refer to racial discrimination. It's mistreatment for any, um, you know, for any uh, behavior. And we find that whites report less discrimination and it doesn't seem to impact their, um, their cognitive, cognitive decline or their cognitive impairment. So that's one factor that seems to be different. Um, we also found that um, social engagement was protective in whites and it seemed to be less protective in African-Americans. Um, but it was probably the nature of the questions we were asking because it was things like, you know, how often do you attend a museum? How often um, do you attend cultural, you know, concert, cultural events? You know, things that might be highly tied to socioeconomic status. So, you know, so there's more work to be done there, but we're starting to get some ideas that some of the, most of the risk factors are the same, but there are some that might be really linked to the social context that differ between the races. This is such great work. Thank you very much, Dr. Burns. Thank you. Our final symposium speaker is Dr. Donald Weaver, co-director of the Kremble Brain Institute at the University Health Network. That is Canada's largest research and teaching hospital. Dr. Weaver's expertise is unique. He's a practicing neurologist, has a PhD in medicinal chemistry and drug design. He has designed and co-developed two drugs that have reached phase three human trials and four others in preclinical development. He holds 27 patents with another 62 pending. Maybe he'll list them all for us. And he's been a founder of eight startup biotech companies. Dr. Weaver, you're up. Hello, um, I'm uh, Donald Weaver, as was uh, introduced. Uh, and uh, normally I give talks about molecules how to make molecules, how to make molecules that interact with receptors. Um, but today I'm going to try to put into perspective what we've heard uh, over the past two days uh, and really try to better understand this really big question that we have in front of us. Why don't we have a cure yet for Alzheimer's disease? Next. As you've heard, uh, but I think it really does bear repetition. Alzheimer's disease, it's a global problem. It's huge. And, and we understand it, but I don't really think that, that it is understood enough. Uh, certainly in the Americas currently, we have 10 million people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and that is going to exceed 30 million within the next 30 years. Worldwide, by 2050, we are going to have over 130 million people with Alzheimer's disease. So it's an immense disease. And the other important thing about this particular slide is that it's global. Uh, and this also is a point which bears repetition. It's a global disease and therefore it needs a global solution. If we come up with some expensive, biologic esoteric drug, is that really going to address the issue? Maybe for a few patients, but we really do need to think of this as a global problem in need of a global solution. Next. And not only is this a, a global disease, it's a disease that's been around for centuries. Now, the first official description of Alzheimer's disease was, of course, by Alzheimer, uh, and that was 115 years ago. Uh, and his first patient, uh, Augusta Detter, shown there, is an individual who passed away in 1906, and, and she officially counts as the first described individual. But let's face it, Alzheimer's was, disease was present long before that. And yes, in the 1700s, not as many people made it to their 70s or 80s, and this is a disease of aging. But Alzheimer's and dementia have been around a long time. Next. And even though it's a global disease, and even though it's been around for centuries, we still do not have a cure. We don't have a disease-modifying drug for Alzheimer's disease. 
next. And and I think and I think the failure that we have in trying to come up with an approach to Alzheimer's disease has really had a spotlight shone on it over the course of the past year. Let's face it, 18 months ago, we didn't even know the word COVID. Now it leads every newscast. And basically in under a year, the biomedical research community mobilized and they've come up with multiple vaccines. I mean, you just have to listen to news and hear, you know, people comparing the various vaccines, uh, you know, be it Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, whatever. There is a lot of different vaccines out there. The companies have responded and academic researchers have responded as well. There's been a significant number of drugs repurposed. They found the value of uh, steroids. Just a lot has happened. And if that can happen in 18 months for devastating disease that we didn't know about 18 months ago, what, what gives with Alzheimer's disease? Next slide. And over the past year, despite the fact that a lot of resources in, in research have been uh, redirected towards uh, COVID, uh, um, research in the other principal diseases have of course continued and is not unusual every year we, uh, as uh, in the past year, as in every year, we've heard about new successful treatments for cancer. And so there are not infrequent announcements about drugs which have improved the outcome in individuals with cancer. Next. But the world of Alzheimer's just doesn't really enjoy this degree uh, of success. Uh, as Barry Greenberg mentioned yesterday, the last successful trial in Alzheimer's disease was 2003. We're coming up on a 20 year dry spell. If you live in Toronto, that's that's almost as long as our hockey team has uh, taken to win anything. Um, and the, um, so, you know, we haven't been uh, coming up with successes and 99.4% of drug trials have failed. And those small number of drug trials that have succeeded have produced symptomatic agents. Um, you know, the drugs that help temporarily with some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, but they're not curative. They're not disease modifying. They don't really influence the natural history uh, of the disease. Next. And the list of failures, you know, if you just look uh, in the in the general press over the course of the last five years, uh, it, it's been disheartening. Uh, and you just read, you know, time after time uh, and not, in, not infrequently you see yet another Alzheimer's disease uh, drug fails. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a litany uh, of failure uh, in terms of the pharmaceuticals that have been developed to try to address Alzheimer's disease. Next. Uh, this this uh, slide from Alzheimer's Research uh, UK um, is five years old, but it's still relevant today. Uh, between October 2014 and February 2015, there were just under 3,000 drugs in development across all diseases. 2% of these were for dementia and 28% were for cancer. Um, and indeed, dementia is one of the major diseases. It is the major disease that has the least amount of drugs in clinical trials on it. That's a significant statement given the fact that it's huge, it's impact, and it's been around for centuries. Next. And even somewhat more distressing over the course of the past decade is that a lot of very significant players in the pharmaceutical space, the large companies, have been moving out of the Alzheimer's space. Uh, and, um, you know, if you look at medicines in development by disease by the pharmaceutical sector, Alzheimer's is not doing that well in this competitive space. A lot of companies have said, you know, the risks are too high, the costs are too much, the probability of failure is just too great. It's not in our company's interest to move forward in this particular disease area. And when you have the large pharmaceutical companies, not focusing on Alzheimer's disease, this is an impediment to moving forward and trying to find cures. Next. Why? Why are we in this position? Why, why did we reach this point where 
you know, in, in a year, we can come up with multiple agents for COVID. Every year, we're coming up with uh, new uh, agents for, for cancer. And yet, you know, with Alzheimer's, it's, uh, we're trying, uh, but, but we're striking out. Next. So uh, I am going to try to distill the um, comments of the last um, two days uh, into what I regard as the reasons why we may not be succeeding. Um, and uh, although there's some uh, sweeping generalizations in what I, I am presenting, uh, I've, uh, I've tried to uh, crystallize them down into five reasons. And I call them the five twos, uh, with two being spelled T-O-O. -O. Um, so um, uh, I hope you're slightly amused at the name five twos. Anyway, um, the, uh, and I'm gonna list them and then I'm gonna go through them individually. So the first of the five twos is number one, too little money for research. Meaning, you know, uh, this is a costly game. And if we're going to make headways, the research community needs to invest more in this as a major disease. So number one, too little money for research. Next. Number two, too many theories of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as we've heard over the course of the past two days, there's protein misfolding, there's the role of inflammation, there's just lots and lots of different possible avenues and approaches that we could be using. And these are lots of theories. And this is both good and bad if we're trying to come up with an approach. But if we're looking to get an, a, a, a cure in an efficient and timely manner, too many theories is a bit of a problem. So that's problem number two. Next. Number three, it's just too hard. Um, the brain is too complex. Alzheimer's is too complex, and therefore we've got a major complex disease of a major complex organ. And because of this, the work is just too expensive. And all that just boils down onto, you know, this is just too hard and too complex a problem. And, you know, because of this, there's lots of roadblocks in front of us and it's slowing us down. Next. Number four, if we get a drug, maybe it's just too late in the course of the disease. You know, the, the, um, the horse is already out of the barn. And, um, uh, you know, we, we may have a drug that, that works, but by the time we know enough to give it to the patient, the disease is just too advanced for the drug to have a fair shot at working. And, you know, if this is true, then this is another huge, huge obstacle in trying to come up with a cure. Next. Finally, Maybe Alzheimer's isn't one disease. Maybe there are too many diseases under that one name. And, you know, we are having wishful thinking, thinking that we can come up with a, a drug that's going to work against Alzheimer's disease, when in fact, it is multiple diseases, which to date, we just aren't diagnostically good enough to meaningfully separate. So those are the, the, the five overarching broad sorts of, of reasons that I'm, I'm you know, going to put forth is, is that why haven't we solved it yet? Well, these are five of the main uh, categories of reasons. Now let's, let's look at each one of these uh, individually. Next. So, um, you know, and I think we're going to have to go over each one of these uh, individually. Um, and it's a hurdle and we're going to have to jump over each one of these hurdles and we're probably going to have to get over all of them before we get to the prize, the prize being uh, a meaningful uh, agent with which to cure Alzheimer's disease. Next. So the first one is too little money for research. And I hate starting with this one. Um, and, and, you know, every time you, you watch a newscast uh, and um, on the news and, and they announced some scientific uh, advance, particularly in the area of biomedical research. Uh, at the end of the newscast, uh, when they are interviewing the researcher, the researcher always ends with more research is needed, more money is needed. And, and it's a bit of a tired refrain. And, and you know, for once I, I would like to hear a newscast uh, or a scientist end on a newscast going, 
the research on this is done. Uh, you know, we, we've got this problem solved. We've got this problem licked on to new, uh, other issues. And you just don't hear it. And it's true across the board, but it's particularly true about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Next. So uh, as, uh, as everyone knows, uh, if you're trying to uh, understand a problem and our problem here is why haven't we solved it yet, follow the money. Uh, and uh, certainly financial support uh, is a major reason for some of the issues that we have in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, the, the tremendous advances that have been made in COVID over the course of the past year really reflects the large amount of investment that has gone into COVID research, both from the pharmaceutical sector perspective, uh, from um, you know, the academic world, the, the government world, a whole lot of money has gone into this. Um, and, and researchers follow the money. A, a lot of researchers have changed their directions and have moved over to COVID. Uh, they have large labs, uh, they have large expensive labs, uh, and they need to be funded and they will go where funding is. And so that, um, you know, if we're trying to encourage more and more individuals to get into research focused on dementia and on Alzheimer's disease, increased funding would be a, an important central component to this. Next. And if we look over the course of the past decade, the last 10, 15 years, you know, something is wrong. Um, the uh, funding uh, in, in the United States um, has improved. Um, and as uh, Barry Greenberg mentioned, it's, it's uh, funding for Alzheimer's and, and dementia has tripled in recent years. But you know, historically, if we look over the course of the past uh, 10, 15 years, Alzheimer's disease has been the poor cousin here. Um, other diseases, cancer, HIV, AIDS, heart disease, have typically attracted substantially more funding. Uh, and on a global uh, perspective, if we you know, look across North America and Europe, uh, in general, um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia have received about one-tenth of the funding of other major disease categories. So, and, and the drug that we developed today is based on basic science that was done 10 years ago. So the, the decreased funding of a decade ago, we're feeling that today. You know, so this is, this is very significant. And this is not a new problem. Next. Why? Um, you know, why have people not been um, you know, uh, supportive uh, of large amounts of funding going in, into dementia research, given just how common the problem is, its prevalence, its incidence, um, you know, and so it's not nice to say, but you frequently hear, well, you know, it's a disorder of old people. It's, it's easier to fundraise for a, a cancer that's going to affect children than it is for disease uh, of old people. And yes, um, I mean, certainly, uh, as Dr. Rockwood uh, nicely presented, this is a disease of aging, yes, but it does not uh, only affect old people. Uh, about 10% of people with Alzheimer's and dementia are under the age of 65. And so people in their late 40s can come up with dementia. And it is a truly devastating disease uh, in their life. And so, you know, it's wrong to say, oh, it's, it's, it's just a, a disease of older people. Maybe we should be focusing our attention uh, on, you know, disorders uh, of youth. Next. And let's be honest, Alzheimer's disease is not just affecting the person who has it, the person who's living with it. Um, this is a disease of families. This is a disease of society. When, uh, when an individual has Alzheimer's disease, their family members or caregivers, frequently they are having to stay home or change their work habits in order to uh, care uh, for their, their loved ones, their, their mother, their father. Uh, and you know, this has an impact on the entire family. So we're not just treating the person with the disease. We really are trying to seek solutions here for the families that are afflicted with this disorder. Next. And, and because of this, 
the, the economic cost of dementia is truly immense. Not only is there the issue uh, of the person who, who has uh, Alzheimer's disease, but it has an, a significant economic impact on the family uh, and on society as a whole. This is costing us a lot. And this alone should be a motivation for governments uh, and other funding agencies to embrace uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia and recognize the importance of increased funding for it. Next. Uh, number two, there's just too many theories of Alzheimer's disease. Next. Um, there are lots of different models and hypotheses of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and, uh, you know, I I've listed them here. Proteopathy. Proteopathy is protein misfolding. Um, and so initially we were told that um, big aggregates of a protein called beta amyloid or amyloid uh, were the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And then, oops, it, it wasn't the big aggregates. It was small aggregates uh, of this um, of this protein. Uh, and now uh, attention is in, has increasingly focused in more recent years on a different protein called tau, which also misfolds and, and aggregates. And so basically protein misfolding or protein clumping uh, of beta amyloid and, and tau uh, are under this one uh, area called proteopathy. Under immunopathy, um, you've heard in uh, previous presentations about uh, microglia uh, and microglia being some of them being pro-inflammatory, these little inflammatory cells in the brain. Um, and they release uh, chemical messengers called cytokines, uh, of which tumor necrosis factor is one, and there's a wide range of other uh, cytokines. And these may be contributing to inflammation uh, in the brain. Uh, and, uh, you know, do they trigger proteopathy? Does proteopathy trigger them? which comes first, what is the connection between proteopathy and immunopathy? And those aren't the only two players. Um, within the brain, there are synapses where one neuron talks to another. And some people, uh, researchers contend that this is primarily a disorder of uh, the synapses. Uh, other individuals um, you know, promote the mitochondria, which are the little energy processing um, components of cells, or maybe it's the membrane itself uh, of the neurons, that's it. And uh, certainly getting a lot of attention, uh, particularly in the last two, three years, has been an infection model uh, out of work uh, primarily in the UK, which identified certain uh, mouth bacteria to seem to be present in, in individuals who had Alzheimer's disease. So there's a whole lot of different approaches. Next slide. Um, and, and as I mentioned, um, the, um, uh, protein misfolding and brain inflammation are, are the two leading targets right now, but they're, they're not the only ones. A and protein misfolding has received a lot of attention over the course of, of the past um, uh, 20 years and brain inflammation is starting to get an, an increased amount uh, of, um, uh, of attention uh, as we go forward, but these aren't the only games in town. There's lots of different approaches and avenues we could be pursuing. Next. Uh, I just want to make a comment on is the amyloid hypothesis dead? Uh, and this is a um, one that is um, uh, often um, heard. Uh, amyloid hypothesis is this uh, protein misfolding one that a protein called beta amyloid uh, clumps up uh, and it is that which uh, causes Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you are undoubtedly aware, many different therapeutic approaches have endeavored to go after this uh, and um, um, they have failed. And so there's a, a group of people saying, you know, the amyloid hypothesis is dead. We have to move on to other areas. And there's a lot to justify that approach. And in the amyloid camp, there's individuals who are saying, this is a, this is a really complicated disease, you know, and, and we haven't exhausted all of our, all of our attempts uh, at, at addressing amyloid, you know, and, and we need more shots on goal on this particular target. And that's an equally um, valid, um, you know, point of view. And so, you know, I think that we have to keep our, our eyes wide open and we have to, you know, embrace all approaches here. Um, we can't side with one camp just yet. Next slide. It's too complex and too expensive, just too hard. Next. Um, the brain is the most complex object in, in, in the universe. 
we have in our heads 100 billion brain cells, and they're connected by more than a trillion synapses. That's complicated. Every time your heart beats, between 20 and 25% of the blood that it squirts out goes to your brain. Your brain does not represent a quarter of your body's mass, but it's getting a quarter of your body's uh, blood supply. And that just, you know, represents this is a very, very busy part of your body. Um, and if you have something going wrong in here, it's going to be really, really challenging to sort out. Next. Um, and Alzheimer's is probably the most complex disease of the most complex organ um, that we have. The, um, and I've already pointed out, you know, that we have the proteopathy, the immunopathy, the synapse. That's one element of complexity in Alzheimer's disease, but there's others. So even if we decide on a target, drug development and drug design for Alzheimer's is a lot harder than designing a drug, say, for a cardiac disorder. Because first of all, you have to get the drug in the brain and there's something called the blood brain barrier. And so that is a unique design challenge that confronts designing drugs for brain diseases such as Alzheimer's disease that is not uh, encountered in other uh, sorts of diseases. The, um, also, uh, we're designing a drug here for older people. Uh, therefore, toxicity is, is a big issue. It has to be a very safe drug and most of these older individuals are taking multiple medications. And so as we design drugs for them, we have to remember that we're going to have a whole lot of interaction with other drugs. And all of this, all of these complexities have to be taken in consideration when, you know, you're sitting down and trying to design a drug molecule as a potential drug for Alzheimer's disease. And then finally, as, as was emphasized repeatedly in many of the excellent presentations earlier today and, and yesterday, are, are the clinical trial issues. Um, you know, we have to take in consideration, is the person multilingual? What's their socioeconomic background? Uh, do they exercise? And so if you're doing a clinical trial and, and you're treating a, a bunch of people who have Alzheimer's disease, some of them are exercising, some aren't, some of them have Mediterranean diet, some don't. How do all these variables figure in uh, and how, how are they going to be calculated into understanding uh, the outcome of the trial? This is, you know, statistically daunting uh, as we move forward. And not only that, it's not, it's not like an antibiotic where you know in 10 days if it's going to work. Um, you know, you got to follow these people for years to see uh, if their drugs are going to have effects. So this is, this is challenging. Next. Um, a study in uh, 2020 estimated that the median cost of getting a new drug to the market is, you know, about 900 million. And there's debate about this. Some people say 600 million, uh, 900 million. It's a lot of money. Alzheimer's disease frequently cost five times that. Um, and if you consider that we're dealing with a failure rate of 99%. So, you know, if you, if you go to um, uh, a funding uh, opportunity and say, oh, I, I have a drug for Alzheimer's, um, what's in the back of their head is, is uh, you got a 99% chance of failing and this is gonna cost a lot. And, and this is understandable. And so, you know, this is, this is another immense hurdle for why we haven't solved this problem yet. Next. Um, too late for the drug to work. Next. Um, so on, on this slide zero uh, on the uh, uh, x-axis, on, on the horizontal axis, is the onset of the disease. That is the time that uh, family or spouse says something's wrong, you know, something's wrong with your memory, something's wrong with your cognition, maybe you should go, you know, see a physician. Um, well, the problem probably started three decades before that. And be you in the proteopathy camp or the uh, immunopathy camp, the neuroinflammation, the protein misfolding, whatever, it happened 20, 30 years before that. And so if we give a drug now, at time zero, is that too late? I mean, has the disease become firmly entrenched and should we be giving it 30 years earlier? And you know, that's, that's an ethical issue because you know, these are drugs that have lots of side effects, lots of problems perhaps, 
And, you know, should you be treating someone for years and years for a disease they may or may not get? And, you know, that, that is a question that's going to have to be addressed uh, as we move forward in, in our quest for a cure. Next. Too many diseases under one name. Next. So all Alzheimer's is dementia, but not all dementia is Alzheimer's. And, and as you know, there are lots of other types of, of dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body, frontotemporal. And I think it's also important that these are all not neat silos. There is an immense overlap, for example, between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's dementia. And certainly one can see evidence of both of these pathologies occurring together uh, in the same individual. So it's, it's a little messy. Next. And there are lots and lots of types of dementia. There are probably more than 50 types of dementia. I've just listed 10 of the more common ones here. But you know, as we go forward, we're tackling more than just Alzheimer's. We're tackling dementia as a whole. Next. And Alzheimer's, is it even a single disease? Um, or is it more than one disease? Is it, it, is it a syndrome? Is it a spectrum? Next. Um, and so, you know, if you um, uh, look at uh, an individual who is 48 years old, who has Alzheimer's, somebody who's 68 years old who has Alzheimer's, and someone who's 88 years old and has Alzheimer's, do they all have the same disease? Maybe not. Um, and, you know, it, it's possible that, um, you know, there are very different subtypes at, of this. And certainly as, um, as Barry Greenberg in his opening remarks yesterday, pointed out that there's a role for precision medicine here, a role for uh, certainly, you know, trying to recognize that there are more than one disease possibly here. And, and, and I like the comment that Barry made was, um, we need to have a reset of our expectations. Um, you know, if you say, well, I, I've got a drug here that is going to uh, cure 10% uh, of people with Alzheimer's, that's a big uh, a success as a cure for Parkinson's disease. And, you know, we really do have to be looking for these subtypes, these treatable subtypes, and, and, and make inroads where we can. Next. Um, because, you know, we're going to have to answer these five, two questions. Uh, and we're going to have to get over these hurdles if we're going to to reach uh, what I call the apple at the top of the tree. Uh, the successes in the pharmaceutical industry over the course of the last hundred years have been from, you know, picking low hanging fruit. Alzheimer's is not a low hanging fruit. It, it's the apple at the top of the tree. Um, you know, and if we're going to get there, there's a whole lot of branches that we have to climb on to get there. And some of these branches have never been stood upon before. And so it, it's daunting uh, as, as we move forward, trying to come up with approaches for this disease. Next. Um, and yeah, there's going to be failures. And, and I certainly hope that this presentation hasn't been too pessimistic. Um, uh, I actually want it to be optimistic because there are a whole lot of avenues, a whole lot of routes that we could pursue as we move forward towards Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and every time we fail, well, we know a route we shouldn't be taking. Uh, and so this is, this is an immensely complex problem. And failure is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's to be expected when you're taking on huge, complex issues. It's how we learn. And we've done a whole lot of learning in the last five to 10 years. And that's why I think that, that the future is bright. Next. But I think we need to adjust our expectations. And I just want to end with this, uh, this what I think is, is an important comment and a, and a lesson. Um, high blood pressure, mechanistically speaking, it is trivial compared to Alzheimer's disease. I mean, high blood pressure is because the blood is exerting too much pressure on the walls of your arteries. Uh, and so from a mechanistic point of view, that's a much simpler issue than trying to understand loss of executive function, reduction in memory, uh, you know, problems with cognition, et cetera, that go along with Alzheimer's disease. And yet, if you have high blood pressure and go to your family physician, you don't expect them to say, here is the pill for high blood pressure, take it. No, 
there are many different medications. Everyone is individualized. Some people are on different medications. Some people are on multiple medications to try to hit different points. And the other really important issue here is that it's not just medications. Um, you know, it, it, your family physician will say to you, maybe you should lose some weight. Maybe you should have a salt restricted diet. Maybe there are some lifestyle modifications. And this is an overall approach to a disorder which is so much simpler than Alzheimer's disease, but we accept it for high blood pressure and we need to accept this for Alzheimer's. We need to think about risk factors, lifestyle modification, uh, avoiding the risks and doing it early. And you know, it's a chronic disease and there's not going to probably be a magic bullet, one drug that you take. And you know, if we adjust our expectations and accept this, then I think we're going to get to solutions a lot more quickly. Next. Um, I would like to end by thanking the various organizations that have supported uh, my lab uh, over the course uh, of the past uh, years. Uh, and of course, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Gardner Foundation, the Crumble Foundation uh, for their support of this particular event as well. Next. And I just want to emphasize uh, and final, just be optimistic. Um, you know, I think that um, um, this is a devastating disorder. Uh, we've learned a lot and I'm optimistic that the future is bright, uh, but the struggle's not done. You know, I wouldn't have been a good moderator if I didn't participate in the technological snafus <laughs> that we've had today. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so what I was saying when my lips were just moving silently was I've got a couple of questions for you now, Don, and then and thank you for your talk, a great talk. Uh, and then we'll have more probably in the panel. But I want to focus on the old age idea that mm -hmm. it's a disease of old age. And we've had a couple of questions related to this. Look at the... Uh, situations with long-term care homes during COVID and uh, how that population seems to be, have been terribly neglected. Uh, another person wrote in and said it took very long time for our, our dad to get diagnosed and maybe it's characterized, maybe it was because it was characterized as an old age, uh, a disease of old age. You know, speaking of COVID, I live in a province where the premier likes to compare the uh, life expectancy of Albertans to the average age at death, and they're within a year, uh, the implication being that, yeah, they've had a good life, they can die. So I totally get it that you said 10% of uh, Alzheimer's is under the age of uh, 60 or 65, I think you said. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that may not be a very persuasive uh, stat. And I'm just wondering if you can envision strategies for making people think a little bit more about the total human lifespan, not just the first 50 or 55 years? Um, certainly. And um, I think uh, lifespan is a, is a bad word. I like the, uh, someone said health span yesterday. Uh, and, and I like that. The, um, uh, we just don't want to live, we want to live well. Uh, and um, making it to, to 90 and making it to 90 in, in, in good cognitive shape are, are two different uh, uh, issues. And more and more people uh, are making it further and further um, uh, to older age. And so because of this, you know, I think that 65 is a very arbitrary number. Uh, yeah. And I don't know why we have that. Um, the, um, uh, and uh, now that I'm very close to it, I, I certainly disagree with 65. <laughs> so <laughs> the, um, um, you know, I think that we need to expand it and, and uh, say, you know, as a society, we have an obligation to give people the best quality life we can as long as we can. Um, and also, as I would mentioned in, in my presentation, uh, you know, it's persuasive that this is a disease of families. Not, not, not just the disease of the individual. There's a lot of people suffering here. Uh, and if we get a drug that works, we're not just helping the patient, we're helping their whole family. And because of the socioeconomic burden of this disease, we're helping our society as a whole. And, and I think that those are 
and can be persuasive arguments uh, in moving forward. Uh, I think particularly the latter one. I mean, you know, in a in a typical group of people, there are very few who have not had the experience of Alzheimer's in their family somewhere, whether it's grandparent age or, or parents age. But um, there are also cultures in the world that revere a, uh, the aged more than we do. And maybe it's going to take some sort of significant cultural change because those funding disparities that you showed are, are really incredibly striking. They are. They are. And it, it's disturbing. Um, and, um, um, you know, researchers are no different from other people. Uh, and I think that, you know, we uh, are bothered by the issue of uh, we like to look where the light is shining. Um, and uh, so, you know, if, if in a disease there's an obvious target, people tend to go towards this. And I think there's just an awful lot of unknowns uh, in Alzheimer's, which which could be fairly daunting and which, you know, keep uh, some individuals away. Plus, you know, there, there's the funding issue. And I think, you know, if we can focus more attention on it and get more advocates and, and really, um, you know, emphasize that we need to be doing something about this, this group, this population, uh, that will be a tremendous step forward for this segment of our society. And I, I think given the, uh, the variety of uh, talks that we've seen over the last couple of days and how they've kind of push the boundaries out, for me anyway, a little bit broader so that we mm -hmm. really think not just, um, you know, as Dr. Barnes said, about uh, different uh, groups, yep. more diversity, uh, factors that we may not have thought about so much. Uh, these are probably messages we have to get across. Most definitely. Um, you know, I, I don't like to think uh, that medicine should not be a pill for every ill. Um, Yes, we're, we're obsessed with getting a, a drug, but there's so much more than that uh, in the comprehensive approach to, uh, to the treatment uh, of Alzheimer's disease. We have to think of the risk factors. We have to think of, uh, of the lifestyle modifications, just as I pointed out with uh, that there are individuals with high blood pressure who lose a few pounds, uh, watch their diet, and all of a sudden they don't have to take their meds anymore. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we have to keep our, our, our mind open and very broad as we approach Alzheimer's. Well, thank you for, for your talk and for these answers, Dr. Reaver, and we'll see you soon in the panel discussion. Thank and uh, we are going to take a short break, a 15-minute break right now, and maybe 15 minutes and 40 seconds, and we'll be back uh, at half past the hour for the panel discussion. Welcome back. It's time now for our panel discussion, and uh, I'm happy to invite back um, all of the people that you have heard speak today, Dr. Lisa Barnes, Don Weaver, Dr. Don Weaver, Dr. <laughs> Kenneth Rockwood, and uh, Dr. Sylvie Belleville. And we have uh, lots of questions, so I, I'm just going to get to them right away. I would say that um, some of the questions are intended for specific people, uh, but I would really invite you all to comment because I'm sure there are lots of things that you haven't had a chance to say today. And so uh, we would like, you know, the more dynamic a panel discussion is, the better. And so, uh, yeah, we'll just get right to it. And um, just a comment, I don't see Kenneth Rockwood. Is he here? I am here. Okay, good. Just not on my screen. That's fine. Not on, uh, your, not on my screen and, either. <laughs> and do you see the little camera toggle? Um, uh, you know what? Um, I, I know what he looks like, and uh, yeah. I, can, I, can, <laughs> I, I can hear him, so uh, it's perfectly good. Uh, Lisa, I'd like to start with you. There's a question from uh, one of the thousand plus people attending this. Uh, African Americans are known to have greater cardiovascular risk factors. Do you think this results from an interaction between genetic and environmental social factors, perhaps such as stress, as you talked about? and uh, does this influence the dementia data? That's a great question. Um, yes, it is true. We know that African-Americans tend to have um, more vascular disease um, and that definitely has an impact on um, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. 
So whether or not it's a, a combination of genetics and, and environmental factors, you know, I'm not a cardiovascular disease researcher, um, but from the studies that I have seen, I have seen that there are some uh, genetic risk factors that are important in cardiovascular disease, things like um, uh, the apolipoprotein, um, not the E4 allele, there's another apolipoprotein that seems to be important in cardiovascular risk. Um, and so it's very, it's very likely that there is a combination, just like all complex diseases of aging, right? There is usually an interaction of genetics and environment. Um, and I think we don't focus enough on the environmental factors, the social determinants that probably do play a role and, and likely uh, impact Alzheimer's down the road. Uh, Lisa, this is a question partly to you, but partly to everybody on the panel regarding First Nations or indigenous communities in both the US and Canada. Are any studies to anybody's knowledge like Lisa's in Chicago being done with uh, indigenous communities in North America? No? So, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, in Canada, the uh, Canadian Consortium on Neurogeneration Generation and Aging, the CCNA, we have a team that is specifically focused um, on that. So, so there are studies going on. I think they'll, we'll need to go some to have them rival the breadth and complexity of uh, what Lisa was talking about, but we are um, making a start in that area. And and there has been other work that has gone on. And I know I have a colleague at, in Wisconsin, Dr. Zulsdorf, who does work. Um, she's starting to make connections with the indigenous populations there. And she's been studying stress and, and very successfully engaging um, that community. So there there's work there, but it's just not as... Um, uh, it's not as far along as the studies in African Americans. No, and understandably, given the size of the populations is less, but uh, the early life stressors are definitely there. So it yes. uh, wouldn't be surprising if some sorts of results analogous to yours uh, would show up. Uh, question here for uh, Sylvie. Are there areas in the world where dementia is relatively rare? Mm -hmm. Uh, there has been studies that have looked, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, there, yes. Has, yeah there has been studies that have looked at uh, differences across uh, different countries and, and because, you know, lifestyle is different, genetic is different. Uh, it's surprising to see that it's actually fairly similar across different population. There's one population and, and I don't know what it, I mean, People are really puzzled about that, but it's in the sub-Saharan. Uh, some countries in sub-Sahara uh, do have a relatively low risk of uh, low uh, prevalence, uh, incidence, I would say, of, of, uh, dementia, of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So it's not really uh, due to the fact that uh, age is, uh, that uh, life expectancy is, is younger, it's, 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 it's lower. It's really it really seems to be something in relation to the environmental genetic that make these people more resistant to dementia. So there seems to be some difference, but overall, uh, it's remarkably similar across different countries. Yeah, that's an important message too, because people love mm. to hear stories of a small village somewhere mm. where they only eat yogurt <laughs> and nobody has dementia. You know, so so seriously, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and well, people, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one thing that is interesting, though, is the lower incidence uh, of uh, uh, the secular changes. So there has been some difference in terms of incidence. I think Kenneth has raised at that point that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the, per the number of cases in different age strata, uh, there is a reduced incidence uh, in the last, I would say, 20 years or 30 years. So it might be due to the fact that people raise their education, uh, people have... Uh, overall better health, better control of vascular factors. So there seems to be some secular effect though. So that, that's interesting and maybe speaks to this question of uh, the environment and the social issues and, and all the things that we do that are modifiable that, have an, that may have a huge impact on the, on the, on the incidents. Not on the prevalence because of course people get older 
uh, they have a higher life expectancy, so it means there's more older people. But in terms of the incidence rate, it's uh, by age, it's uh, there's an improvement. I like to just add to that because what you just said is really um, right on point. Um, Hugh Hendry uh, out of in India, Indiana, uh, he had a really fascinating study comparing um, Nigerians and Ibadan to uh, African Americans mm -hmm. in Indianapolis that went on for many years. And he found that the the uh, incidence rates were lower in, in yep. the Nigerians um, than in African Americans in, in Indiana. And so, you know, that sort of underscores that there's really a social um, aspect, right, to the disease because, you know, obviously Africans and African Americans share, you know, genetics, right? Um, but you see that there's difference, in, you know, huge difference in their environment, their eating pattern, how sedentary people are. So those lifestyle factors really do matter. Um, Dawn raised uh, the issue of funding. It's been raised before uh, yesterday as well. Um, and pointed out that companies are not generally enthusiastic these days to pursue uh, new Alzheimer's drugs. And partly the cost is enormous. But do any of you, I'd like comments from anybody. Do you think drug companies might be hesitant because if you compare it to developing a COVID vaccine, the target for the COVID vaccine was very specific. If you can, if you can, you know, address the spike protein, then you could probably get a good vaccine. But as we've learned over the past two days, the the expanse of research that's necessary to really well define Alzheimer's is enormous, and maybe that just looks to drug companies like there's no uh, identifiable target. Um, yeah, I think that the problem is, is that we have so many targets. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's protein misfolding, there's um, uh, immunopathy targets, and none of them has emerged as a front runner. Uh, and there's various groups supporting various targets. Um, and um, when you consider the cost of developing a drug, unless someone stands up and goes, this is the target, which no one's going to do, uh, you know, I, I can understand their reluctance. Don't agree with it, but I can understand it. <laughs> so what about this funding issue? How do any of you think um, funding for Alzheimer's and other dementias can be raised? Well, obviously we, we need better politics. I mean, we're in an environment, and I'm a geriatrician, I live with this, right? Our argument is strong, but the politics are weak. And the politics are weak because it's a population that uh, ha where everybody knows someone, but it's still a disease in which uh, shame and stigma are an important part of the lived experience. And, and, and it, it really hasn't been able to gain traction in the way that other illnesses have. I know that people have been critical looking kind of inside the tent um, uh, when you see various Alzheimer's associations, Alzheimer's societies make a big profile about the young people who get dementia. Um, but I think that uh, uh, really if we could make clearer what the cost is, but also as was said, Alzheimer's is a disease of the family. Right? One person has the disease, the entire family is affected. And, and, and if we understood just how important the, the cost is from those terms, I think that, that would be worthwhile. I saw an interesting thing in the chat which said, hey, the boomers are getting it now. I mean, they're gonna, <laughs> now, now we can look for something. Um, Pro and, and, problem and, solved. And, and there's, you know, there's a extent to which that might be true, but I, I, I know, I'm, so I'm part of the Canadian Collaboration Neurogeneration in Aging. And we started about 10 years ago and the government of the day made an announcement uh, uh, at a big um, uh, big Alzheimer's meeting that was happening in Vancouver and said it would be $100 million. And we thought, fantastic. And in the end, we wound up with somewhere around a fifth of that number. And it was so cynical to see all the things that were done to double count money that was spent and to say, oh, this money you know, is actually in this other way. We're spending on Alzheimer's now and so on and so on. And so on. I, 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 I was amazed at how how quickly the energy went out of the room. And we, we, we tried very hard to find advocates within you know, the government, within the bureaucracy, and there was really no one was able to carry the day uh, uh, over these immensely cynical calculations that were done to show we were actually spending the money. There's nothing to look at here, move along, right? I, 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 it's probably one of the most discouraging things 
that's happened to me in my career was to see how deeply rooted the cynicism was about actually spending dollars. I think another problem, um, you know, added to that is that uh, Alzheimer's for many communities is still seen as a natural part of aging and that there's nothing we can do about it. So mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, until we really are able to educate people about, you know, these modifiable risk factors and, you know, and help them understand that this is a disease that starts decades before you see symptoms, I think we can get more people behind us as advocates. You know, you have to have the community sort of weigh <clears> in <throat> and, and care about this problem more than they currently do. So if I could speak to that too, there, so there's a book that just came out and it's called um, Alexa and it's a biography of Alexa McDonough, uh, who was the leader of the federal NDP party in Nova Scotia where I am. She's a legend and, and, and you know, she's the sort of per person who seemed to unite a lot of people. And um, uh, just in the last 18 months or so, Alexa decided to go public with her diagnosis of Alzheimer's. She was diagnosed in 2011 and she did really, really, really well for five or six years. And even now the disease is clearly more advanced. She's still recognizably herself. And what I found was so striking um, because I've been her doctor and of course, you know, normally you couldn't beat out of me that I've uh, uh, cared for a patient uh, by name. Um, uh, but Alexa wanted to share her experience because she wanted people to know how it was possible still to live a valuable life when you responded to treatment, when you've done well overall. She's, um, uh, I think, a real inspiration. And I think that the more that we have people like that coming forward, not hiding, uh, being clear, being pragmatic, uh, they and their families, because it's, it's a big deal for them all. Th that's the sort of thing I think it's going to take people to really get that it's not a part of normal aging, which is what uh, she'd been told when she was trying to get a diagnosis and she, and, and she was young and what her parents before that had been uh, told. And it's not, it's not fatal, it's not the end. I, I was really struck with um, the video that we saw. We said, you know, it's, he's not like he's fading and going away. It's different, but it's still recognizably him. I used to work for a doctor and I learned from him and, and this is in the days before there was treatment. And believe me, I would never go back. I would never go back to those days. But what this man said when he made a diagnosis, he, he would say, the people who love you now will always love you. And the things important to you now will always be important to you. And this diagnosis does not change who you are. And I think that, you know, I got out of saying that because it, the words didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. And treatment has changed that to an important extent. But I think we really need to address some of the, the stigma head on if we're going to make headway. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And it, as a media person, it makes me wonder whether a book is the actually ideal way of doing this or whether a video such as we saw or how, that, how you get that message across in an effective way. I want to ask another question about messaging and uh, the Canadians in the group might remember something called participation, which was a huge advertising campaign here, like Lisa, just to get people more physically active. I, I guess it was like 20 or 25 years ago. And um, the line that I remember was that the average Canadian is as fit as a 70 year old Swede. And so we were, we were kind of shamed, some of us were anyway, into, into being more active and yet, I wonder, given that activity, both mental and physical, is so important in this area, whether a campaign of some kind like mm -hmm. that might be helpful. But I uh, invite comment on that. It may be a silly idea. I don't know. I don't think that's a silly idea. And actually, the dementia uh, World Dementia Council a few years ago mentioned that uh, uh, brain health and cognitive health should be a, a, a matter of public uh, campaign advocacy. So there should be uh, public campaigns regarding brain health and cognitive health. And I think that, that the way they would probably bring it is more in a positive manner rather than dementia, because that's like the flip side of the coin. Uh, but I think you're absolutely right. And uh, we need, and I, I know that there's some interest regarding this from some public health agencies, not all of them. 
but uh, there should definitely be uh, more you know but because it, i think it's uh, what's good for your art is good for your brain but not entirely so i think it's it would be nice to have a campaign that strictly or more focused really focus on the on the notion of brain health yeah i i agree with that and when i give presentations in the community you know i i try to have that message of how do you build a better brain a stronger brain and i you know introduce all of those risk factors that we know you know, through observational studies and some through interventions that have shown to be effective. I think that resonates more with people than shaming them or scaring them about about the disease. Yeah. You know, like you know, how do you how do you remain healthy as you age? That's everyone wants to know that, right? Do you think that lingering concept that uh, dementia is just a part of aging accounts for mm -hmm. um, people kind of not? I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but basically for writing off people with dementia because they feel nothing can be done. Well, it's the notion of ageism. I mean, what we talked when we talked earlier about the problem with funding. I mean, I think that essential. There's really a big issue in relation to ageism. So uh, how much we, um, uh, you know, it's interesting with the COVID because the COVID we know that people who die are those who are older and yet there's been a huge effort in trying to solve COVID but still there were people saying oh we really is it really a good thing to you know help very old and frail individuals uh, when young people have to stay at home which is terrible you know to say that but uh, but still people have put all this money and all this effort and one argument was also because you maintain your healthcare system. So, so I think that that that's that's another issue. Um, but, but but I think that that this problem with with I mean we have to be very careful about not carrying uh, ageism in our own discourse. Yes, uh, let's turn uh, to a couple of uh, specifically brain questions. Um, this one uh, comes from a viewer and it's directed to Dawn, but um, again, I think everyone, everyone can feel free to answer. <laughs> Dawn might not even want to answer. I don't know. <laughs> that, that's my uh, hint. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very uh, short and specific question. What's the best way to reduce inflammation in the body? It appears to contribute to many diseases. I think that was actually answered by a speaker yesterday. Um, physically fit, uh, be active, uh, be socially engaged and be physically active. And if you do those sorts of things, um, that is probably a good way of trying to head off uh, the inflammation that is implicated in so many disorders, not just Alzheimer's. There have even been suggestions by medical people that taking an 81 milligram a day aspirin would be a good idea. Um, yeah, certainly. And I mean, a variety of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and anti-inflammatory drugs have been looked at. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, um, the, the debate on that is, is certainly open. Uh, if you have Alzheimer's, I don't think uh, taking 81 milligrams of aspirin is going to change much. Uh, and um, uh, once again, you know, um, be physically active. I think that's more important than taking 81 milligrams of aspirin. Swallowing a pill is easy. Pushing away from the table and doing things is more challenging. And I think it's worthwhile to push away from the table and do things. Uh, Sylvie, your, your discussion of brain maintenance and brain reserve is really fascinating. Uh, especially, well, they're both fascinating, but brain reserve particularly because uh, you, you said that, uh, you know, it's maybe better, more efficient, more numerous networks, something like that. But do we have a really detailed understanding of what brain reserve means? Uh, not at all. <laughs> we know the effect. We know how, uh, we, we, I mean, there's fair, a lot of evidence showing that it is actually occurring. Um, you know, the group, Reserve Resilience Group, the uh, collaboratory group that I told you about, led by Jakob Stern, they, they started to try to um, get funding for um, animal studies. So trying to bring animal models into the field of cognitive reserve, because um, most of the, I mean, these two 
animal models don't really talk to human models in this field. And I think that if we want to know more about the mechanisms that are actually occurring and uh, to, to support cognitive reserve, we, we would really benefit highly from animal models where we could manipulate conditions, uh, the environment, uh, and look at measures as what's actually uh, happening in the brain. And I think that intervention studies will be interesting, particularly if they are, um, you know, if people are looking at what they, what, what they change in the brain, and if they're looking at biomarkers, I think they will, we will better understand what's happening. But we, at this point, we don't really know that much apart from this hypothesis that it's probably related to more, um, uh, more flexible neur neural networks and, 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 and more efficient brain. Mm. So, uh, you know, though, um, when I talk about Alzheimer's to people and talk about the risks, they're always uh, those people who are 60 and over are a little bit depressed when they hear that how far they went in school is an important factor because you can't. But that's my question. Can you recapture that uh, mm -hmm. when you're 60? Because, you know, doing Sudoku and crossword puzzles and so on doesn't seem to me to be equivalent to, you know, doing a degree or even finishing grade 12. Uh, how equivalent are they? efforts to do that late in life versus schooling? Well, there's two points in your question, if I can, if I may. Uh, one is, um, is uh, if you didn't go to school and you, you may still have had a life, uh, you know, cognitively stimulating lifestyle, you know. So it does, early school seems to be associated with a lot of uh, benefit because when you go early in school, um, Usually, you are um, you have better access to uh, you know health education. This is there's a lot of you're more physically active. You you better eat. You have a better profession. So there's a lot of positive aspects in relation to early school. But if you didn't go to school, uh, if you didn't have a, a higher high education, you can still benefit from the fact that you've had. A stimulating lifestyle, so cognitively stimulating lifestyle. And studies have shown that having had a cognitively stimulating lifestyle can protect you from uh, from dementia. So it's not only early life education, although I, I know that this wasn't in, included, and maybe Ken has something to tell us about that, was well, not included in the Livingstone model, but uh, there's a few, there's quite a bit, a few studies showing that, uh, you know, even uh, mid-life uh, uh, cognitively stimulating, engaging activities can have an, a protective effect. Yeah, so we looked at uh, that on the Lancet Commission and it didn't make the final cut. It, it, that was a really invigorating set of <laughs> meetings to go to and, and, and papers to read and, and such. Um, and part of the idea was that there was a there was a clear attenuation of the observational studies of the benefit um, um, after about the age of 50. And, and, and uh, but those studies were 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 very difficult to generalize from because people who w maintain an act, a cognitively active lifestyle at the age of fifty just kept going on w w with that. So it's hard to determine where they were harvesting their benefit from. So there are a lot of technical issues having to do with that. And the curious thing that we don't look at incidence density of risk factors, we look at presence or absence at baseline. And, and there's a ton of reasons why that might still be true, but the standards were set in a very rigorous way so that we were able to put forward things that, that we could hand on hard and say, this has been clearly demonstrated. And, and I, you know, there's no reason not to engage in a cognitively active lifestyle. The, the, the we observation that I've had, having had to learn stuff as I've gotten older and found it harder to, you know, process, you know, uh, uh, what type of pneumonia do people with liver transplants get and uh, <laughs> thousands of stuff like that and it's just harder but I, but I'm I, I encourage myself with the thought that it's this very it's it's the fact that it's hard that must be beneficial all that energy is going to be being used in some useful way that's as good as a run <laughs> and maybe if I may I think that we all have had the experience during the COVID of older adults being dramatically understimulated at all level and we showed the I mean we've all observed the terrible effect. So I think that even though, I mean, we, we don't have 
large evidence. There's clearly uh, an effect, a, a detrimental effect of under-stimulation. So I think that uh, it's really important to keep uh, the brain active and to keep people engaged. And it has to be for things that are fun also. It has to be for, so I, I read some of the comments earlier, people said, I'm, I'm not a, a social person. Should I engage in social things? Well, if it stress you, no, don't engage, but do things. Do things that you like, uh, uh, go out. Uh, I mean, you don't have to engage in things that don't, don't interest you uh, because I, I don't think that's a good way to go on, but you, you need just need to, to keep, uh, to learn new things and to go out of your comfort zone once in a while. So, so, um, so may I make a slightly, a slightly political point about this. You, the, so, so COVID has a, a huge amount. It, 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 you know, it's, a, it's been a sad privilege to be involved with this and particularly see, see some of it up close. A, and it should stimulate and has stimulated ideas for how to do things differently. And a, a fantastic thing happened during this time in which suddenly money became available to test some uh, uh, new approaches and some new ideas. And, and, and that's a kind of you know, full-throated effort that was nimble and that brought together teams and, and that actually encouraged new ideas in the way that traditional science, traditional science funding really doesn't. You know, we, we fund so little that no one wants to take a chance. And so you, know, you really can't get funded for the work you want to do. You kind of get funded for the work that you've done because that's all clear and straightforward. So you use that additional work to make the investment to do the crazy stuff. But that's a very inefficient way to proceed, that you can't actually get funded to do the thing that you think is the most important, the most interesting. And we've shown as a country, we can actually shift like that. Like we can actually make big changes in a short period of time. And I think we need to have some part of, of, of the optimism that goes with that to tackle this. This is a huge problem. So let's get at it. It, it I guess seems obvious that COVID would be very difficult for people with dementia, to, but, but has that actually been studied and uh, do we actually know some facts about that? There was a study that came out recently, I think within the last few months, um, showing that um, dementia patients had a higher risk of COVID. Did anyone see that? It was weighing it all? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was wondering if there was, you know, like some type of, some type of interaction factor with EPOE4. Uh, I don't know, but I, I, it struck me also. I think that's very, it's fascinating. The part of it that I paid attention to was the very high burden of delirium in COVID-19 and the idea that it doesn't resolve in the fashion that we've been accustomed to with delirium otherwise, which is not a complete resolution, but it's the majority case. And, and, uh, uh, and so this may wind up being a long lasting legacy of that. And it, Again, it's 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 another area in, in in which we need science that's flexible and nimble enough to tackle the questions that are right in front of our face, even though that isn't how we set up the funding committees and all that sort of stuff. And I, and I think, you know, a a rational approach would be for a sufficiently well-funded organization to say we're, we're going to put aside X percent of our funding in this nimble pot. So, um, Ken. Um Sylvie mentioned that if you're not an outgoing person, don't torture yourself to become an outgoing person because the stress of doing that wouldn't negate any of the social benefits. But I mean, extroversion, introversion is one of the fundamental pieces of human personality. So would that suggest that, uh, and personality uh, from what I know, which isn't that much, is that it's pretty consistent throughout life. So would that suggest that people who are introverted are actually at a, at a bit of a disadvantage in terms of using social interaction as one of the tools to delay or prevent dementia? So that's an excellent question. I wish I knew the answer. I know there's work that has looked at various aspects of personality and dementia risk. The signal wasn't clear enough for me to sort it out. But I, well, I'm the, sure other people would know. So you probably know. Well, the, the the good news is that there's a lot of uh, protective and risk factors. I mean, 
and uh, so yeah. I mean if, if you're if you're if you're it stresses you to go out and increase your network size <laughs> your social network size you you could you know do physical activity on your own or improve your diet so so what I like about the complexity of uh, those risks and the diversity of those risk factors and protective factors is that you can adjust those to your risk profile, but also to your preference. So I think that's an important piece. And in yeah, our I, studies, I think that... oh, sorry. In our studies, uh, the religious order study, we, we have looked at personality and dementia risk, and we find, you know, certain uh, conscientiousness is protective. Um, neuroticism is very clearly a risk factor across many different uh, different populations in our cohort studies. Um, but I, you know, I don't. I don't know about um, introversion uh, being a risk. I mean, I'm very introverted. I hope it's not a risk factor. I think it's more about, for, um, you know, it's, it's about social isolation and loneliness, right? You could be an introverted person and not feel lonely. Mm. You know? So maybe that's what the difference is. But, you know, we, we probably need more research in that area. I remember when I heard that, uh, uh, say, extroversion was, or introversion might, might be a risk factor. I was cynical about it until I found out that cynicism is a risk factor. <laughs> so I, I changed my mind. Um, Something for everyone. Yeah, exactly. So there are clear gender differences in dementia. And I would, uh, I don't know what they all are, but I would ask you to please comment on those and why they're important. Anybody? <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just talk about our work, and then other people can chime in. Sure. But we know that <laughs> this disease is a disease of women. Two thirds of people with this dementia are women. Um, whether or not the risk is greater, or is, or is it just that women live longer? I think that's still something that needs to be sorted out. Um, but we have found when we look at our studies of pathology that the effects of pathology are are um, stronger in and women. So given the same mm -hmm. level of pathology, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the effects of pathology mm -hmm. is worse if you're a woman than if you're a man. And so the idea could be that, you know, maybe it's something about the loss of estrogen as people, you know, as women get older and go through the postmenopausal period, you know, it's maybe something about, you know, hormones. We're not really sure. APOE4 has a, a, a really strong effect. You know, women who are E4 carriers have a, a worse, have worse outcomes for dementia. Uh, both uh, with pathology and, and with cognitive function. Um, so it's definitely something there with gender that's going on. Yes. Right? Maybe others can speak uh, more. Yeah, I think as, as since I presented on cognitive reserve, I should mention that, you know, it's possible that women didn't have the opportunity to build such a high co level of cognitive reserve as men because they generally have less education. They particularly this older generation of women. And uh, it will be interesting to see whether changes in the social, um, you know, on the profession, level of profession, level of and stress also, uh, whether that has an impact on the, the sex ratio. But that, that's a very important question to address, complex probably. I, I can tell you from the work we've done on frailty that at any age, women have um, more health deficits than men do. Uh, but before we say they're frailer, it's also the case that for any level of health deficit accumulation, men die uh, much before women do. So so, so clearly, this is a complicated topic. And that's why I was su 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 surprised a bit to hear that the, that, that the women expressed the pathology more than the men did. And, and I just, that's fascinating. And, um, We'll it's not that they express the well. It's not that they have more pathology. It's just that the effect was stronger. The effect. Yeah. So that would go. That would go in favor of cognitive reserve effect. No, right? Yeah. Because it, it might mean that they don't have this moderation effect that men would have. Yes. It's it's so level, I suppose you control. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what we found in the moderation work. As we'd say in Newfoundland, it's a job to say, my dear. It's tricky enough. <laughs> We have about um, four minutes uh, left. And um, if I could, given that we've sort of touched on more than once important messages to give the public, um, could you each take one minute and give me a sense of what you think 
one or at most two important messages are to the public right now? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> Um, I think an important message is that this disease is very complex and it's heterogeneous. And right now, almost everything we know about the disease, we're learning from a single population. We clearly need to have more diverse participants in the research, um, whether it's you define it by race, ethnicity, by geographic uh, location, socioeconomic status, or gender. We cannot base all of our knowledge on a single population and expect to get a cure that's going to work for everyone. Next. So I'd say two things. Number one, exercise in groups. That's what I tell the public to do. Get, you know, harvest the social and the physical at the same time. And I, what I say to the scientific community is the problems of old age come as a package and we're going to be in a tough spot if we imagine we can boil this down to a single protein abnormality. Good. Sylvie? I would say do what you are doing now. So all the public who are here today, they are interested to know, they are uh, curious, uh, they keep their brain active, and obviously that's why they are here. Uh, so I would say continue to do that. That's the way to go uh, and uh, be mindful about the power you ha you can have on your health you have power in your health and uh, so that's uh, the message i would give the public and um, and the message i would give researchers is uh, uh, be careful about the balance between the what i would call negative driving forces and positive driving forces we have to uh, it's going to be complicated but i think we have to take into account those two factors in the disease if we want to understand it and to politicians, give us money. <laughs> I mean, it's short. Don? Uh, number one, uh, Alzheimer's is not a natural consequence of aging. Uh, it is separate. Number two, um, there's light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, I, and I, you know, I did um, uh, enumerate a, a whole raft of failures, uh, but I did so in a positive way, hopefully. Uh, and that uh, there are many druggable targets, we're learning more and more about them. And um, yes, uh, we are getting there slowly, but we will get there. Thank you all, Lisa, Sylvie, Ken, Don. Um, great comments. And this type of discussion is, I think, exactly what we need a lot more of in the world of Alzheimer's research so that we can, as Don suggests, move closer to that light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to host and moderate this event, hear from all the speakers, both today and yesterday. Remember, the event has been recorded. You'll have the opportunity to watch it back on the Crowdcast site and also on the Kremble YouTube channel. And now I'm going to send it back to Dr. Don Weaver for closing remarks. Um, uh, I'll close up by uh, expressing some thanks. So first, uh, thank you to, uh, to Jay Ingram. Uh, for moderating the event uh, and for doing so with great expertise. And I've noticed from the comments at the side, um, people thought he was terrific and I agree. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the wonderful speakers who have generously given their time and their expertise to this symposium. Uh, I think that it really was a, a true meeting of the minds. It brought together a lot of complementary uh, different approaches and I think it integrated nicely together as a whole. I would like to thank all of you, the attendees, uh, who have come together from many different worlds, from the scientific community, as, those, uh, as well as those with lived experiences, and those who care for people with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia and advocate on their behalf. Um, over the course of the last two days, we've had attendees from all over the world, from the pharmaceutical industry, from academia, from media, uh, from people living with Alzheimer's, caregivers, and many with no connection at all to Alzheimer's, but with one common purpose, and that was to better understand this disease and its impact. Um, our hope is that after today, you will leave feeling more informed, more engaged, more empowered, and, and more inspired uh, to, to continue to learn about Alzheimer's, to support Alzheimer's research, and to participate in it. We still don't have the answers, uh, and we're going to need you on our side if we're going to keep this dream, the dream of a cure for Alzheimer's alive. 
uh, to the Gardner and the Kremble Foundations, I, I simply say thank you uh, for your support and for your very clear vision and mandate to make this a true public outreach event where science is made accessible to everyone and one that brings science and the public together to make tangible changes. Um, as, as you've witnessed over the last two days, we've had a number of, uh, of technical glitches. And I'm sure if you look up uh, technical incompetence or if you Google it, uh, you will find links to me. Uh, so with that, I would just like to thank the many people who made this possible. Heather, Carly, Michael, Matt, Twain, and Leanne, uh, who have been busy behind the scenes making sure that this ran smoothly, and I thank them tremendously. Uh, on a final note, I would just like to, to end by asking you a, a favor. Um, as you go forward, I'd ask you to, to continue to learn about Alzheimer's disease, to read about it, and to embrace it, um, and to become an advocate for it. Remember, science needs you. If we're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel, if we're going to reach the apple at the top of the tree, we're all going to have to work together to truly solve Alzheimer's disease and all the dementias. And with that, I will close and say thank you for your participation and involvement. I sincerely hope that you have enjoyed the last two days. Thank you.